Okay, just double checking that everything is going to work out. This is a quite a technical show compared to most that happen on the page. So hopefully it's going to work all right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to court, the third quarter of Watch Report. This is a, a very chilled show. This is one when, I don't even know if we're live. We are live. Okay, cool. I'm experimenting to see if it's any good having that little avatar in the bottom left of the screen. It might be a bit more engaging, maybe not. We'll see. I can always get rid of it if it doesn't work. But in over the winter months, I'm going to have a webcam and everything sorted out. So I'll be sitting where that little black ID is there at the base. And I've set up the page so it's going to be nice and clear for us to see. Welcome, everybody, to the show. It's been a while since we've done one of these. It's a quarterly roundup that goes through about 30 different watches, some of the best watches that have been released over the, the quarter period. So between July and September, since I missed October, we're going to throw in October into the mix too. And let's, yeah, watch report guy. <laughs> okay, let me get to the chat, say hi to you all. I see Megan's joined us and we have Pedro and Sam Ray. Welcome, Sam Ray. Mr. Beaver, congrats on the new house, sir. I'll catch up with you. Uh, Raymond, Eric, welcome. That rugby was flipping awesome. Chile, uh, Javier, Hans, Scott, all of you who are joining, I see Nicholas again, Mooseman, Jim. Yeah, it's great. And all the ID guns stuff showing again. Yeah, I think it's nice not having the guns on <laughs> on a live stream. It's really nice keeping it a bit more subtle. Yes, there is some more news on the on the Pelagos we can chat about in a moment, definitely. Okay, let's get right into it. Should I, question yes or no whether I should keep the little ID at the bottom or get rid of it. Because what's going to happen is there's going to be a watch on the left and then uh, news articles on the right. Before we do that, though, I first just want to screen share this quickly. I have to do my due diligence. Um, our man, Blue Shirt Buddha, I have linked the support on, at the top of the chat if you'd like to follow it. Before considering donating anything to the channel, please consider donating to our man, Blue Shirt, and his rehab. Uh, he's been going through hell. He deserves all the support he can get. And yeah, it's a good cause. It really is a good cause for us as a community. So uh, I think it's very important. And yeah, it's just great. I think the feedback so far, I mean, we've seen, the, we've gone so much higher over the standard raised goal. I mean, we could easily cap it at 20, even more, maybe we push it. Um, I think that would be very special. Uh, thoughts to you, Blue Shirt, if you are joining in, if you're listening to us, if you are out there. Uh, yeah. But anyway, um, keep that in mind. The link's going to stay pinned at the top of the chat throughout the show. And uh, yeah, let's get into what's been going on over the last two weeks. Had some two cool videos. I've really enjoyed putting these together and they, they worked out so nicely. Corner of the screen, I will link a, the video to this after the show. The Yachtmaster Titanium is not official, but I think we can almost guarantee that it's going to be released very soon. And it's a pretty exciting prospect, all things considered. It's not the most exciting watch of all, but I mean, the formula just works. It's a 42 millimeter titanium sports model. No date complication. They're going to be giving a nylon strap to the piece for the first time. All sorts of little bits and pieces that's going to make it quite the, quite the standout tool watch in the Rolex camp, which is so different to you know, how we normally see Rolex as steel sports watches. And what they're going to be doing with the whole, um, the way they're making this titanium so good, where they're, they're adding some more, you know, whether it's anthracite coating, I, I go through a lot more in the video, but it's it's a very interesting prospect. But the one the one thing that we've all been talking about, and this this was a lot of a lot of fun to put together. I've, I've sat on this news for about two weeks, being able to share a rendition of the, this is the Marine National variant of the Pelagos that has been leaked and shared and sold. One example has been sold, and I'll also link that video in the corner of the screen. It's, I'm so chuffed with this. I am so excited to see this materialize. Um, the news, Valera asked in the chat, I have, I'm sorry, I've missed a couple of you. I see Thomas joining in. Welcome, Neferion. Valera asked a question about news on the Pelagos. Have I heard anything else? Just taking a hit from the water. Most recent news is pretty awesome. So it happens that Dubai Watch Week is around the corner. And next to that, a couple, I think there were a couple of comments in the chat. Of course, the not sorry, in the comments of the video, the comments just go wild and you can't keep track. But one comment was left saying that I've already put my name down for one of these and there's going to be a launch 17th of November. 17th of November. They're going to be launching something special. So could mean that we are seeing this watch launched at the end of the year it's a very good it's a very good thing when you think about the business end of year you're spending your bonus christmas is around the corner yeah it, it kind of does line up pretty well 
be good to see this release. Also, a lot of talk about what movements in this watch. I'm just taking the magic mouse. Uh, 200 meters, a lot has been mentioning that it's it's an ETA-based movement, and I believe that they actually used an ETA movement in the Marine National models just for ease of service because these watches are going to be used. They're probably going to be sent in and repaired pretty often, so ETA is easier to work on, whereas the the consumer, the civilian model with the four lines of text is going to be used. Uh, it's probably going to use a modern Tudor movement, probably an updated 70-hour power reserve model. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's pretty exciting. And and I've liked how the discussion went between those who appreciate theirs next to this and this change. Some are saying that the bezel's too heavy. Yeah. Some saying that it doesn't have a bracelet. I mean, that's another big divisive tr uh, factor. I, I love the whole idea of integrated uh not spring bars, tabs that run along the underside of the case. I didn't save any more images. This is the best. This is the best I've saved just as a preview. But uh, it's going to be it's going to be pretty fun. And don't know about the helium escape valve, Nicholas. Um, I would imagine for the two hundred, probably not. Of course, I think Valera mentions it brings the scale down, the the thickness of the watch if it's using. <laughs> He's taking magic. What? Oh, uh, okay. I'm going to try and keep up with you in the chat. It is going pretty pretty wild. Anyway, so that's that's it in a nutshell. Um, really looking forward to this watch as far as someone who's never wanted to own a tutor before this is a prospect that is special it's an anniversary piece in a way it's paying tribute to mill subs and you know their heritage it's a true snowflake of what they made all those years back fixed lugs <laughs> it's an interesting it's an interesting thing okay let's get rid of this and try and get this right i hope I really hope it all presents well. So the left-hand side of the screen, I'm going to drag this cross, okay, and then pull up the news articles. Be careful, we're going to enter the matrix when it does that. There we go. So left-hand, we're going to. I'm going to try and stop saying so so much. Left-hand side, we're going to have the watches. Right-hand side, we have news articles to discuss, and I've only picked 30 watches, 32 or so watches to talk about. It's not going to be very heavy. I mean, this quarter that we've gone through hasn't been that exciting. All things considered, they're, they're not new models that have been released, but lots of, um, you know, reskins and new colors, and some really have piqued our interest. So it's worth worth sharing and discussing. Any PAMs? I don't think so, Eric. No. Uh, it's actually entirely Swiss and German. There weren't any Seikos that really stood out to me this over this quarter. Some only watch pieces that, I mean, you're seeing one right now. The reason why I'm sharing this is a bit is twofold. I think it's such an amazing piece of design. I think, uh, you know, MBNF, they do such cool work. But my favorite part of all are the sketches that went into this and the, the drawings that were thrown together to highlight the concept. And I wanted to share a bit of, you know, ID olden days. A couple of years back, I did a few sketches kind of similar. It would be nice to compare. Okay. And thank you, Thomas, about the, the Tudor video. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. It was such a fun thing. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing. I must say, like, compared to most releases that we've chatted about over the last two episodes, this one is a bit more plain. Like, we, yeah, it's it's pretty diverse. But I think the best part will be talking around the releases and what they could mean to us, what we find interesting about them. You know, the engagement's always fun about these these discussions. Okay, hitting the tiny, tiny glass of, uh, what am I having? Belvini tonight? Yeah, a little bit more of the Belvini. Got a coffee, got a water. It's also the 6th of November, but there's fireworks going off like crazy outside my window. So if I do swear out loud, probably because a firework went off over my head. Okay, so I see James joining us and many more that I'm missing. I see Marco and I will get to that comment. Oh, God, it's just so much going Julian and F1PTB. It's great having you all here. Thank you. And again, thank you everyone for the support and for being a part of these shows and sitting in, listening. Put your feet up. Enjoy yourselves. Can you make a video about the watch numeral designs, Yusuf? Yeah, I mean, they're beautiful. Okay, so just quickly, let's run through this watch. It's called the Panda. This is not the only time MBNF has made one of these pieces, I believe. They have uh, done different colorways before, but the one part I really wanted to emphasize, can I zoom into this? Yes, I can. These these illustrations are some of my favorite things about this watch. Honestly, like as much as I love the watch, I, I think the way they stylized these images and got them so nicely done. Now, coming from a, a design background, I learned all about this stuff. I'll show you a sketch that mirrors this in a way. I'll actually get it on in a second. Getting my docs a sub 200 next week. It's a good watch, James. It's a really good watch. What am I drinking tonight? Michael asks, uh, Belvini 12. It's a really light whiskey, which is nice for the show. 
I did, I did a review of it actually, a mini review in the in the Baltic video from a couple of weeks back. I said the one downside to it is it's almost too light because it's a sherry cask finish. The flavor just disappears because it's a forty percent. If it was a forty three or forty six, it would have a lot more staying power. Yeah. So <laughs> feed the MBNF bamboo and it'll work. Yeah, I mean that's a part of the the format. So yeah, it's a, it's a, such a I love these drawings. Anyway, so back of my mind, I was this reminded me of something. And I look back into the archives of my portfolio and things, and I realized that I did something similar a couple of years back where I, I sketched out some tree frogs. So this is a, an ID exclusive. <laughs> I think I did this in 2017, 2018. Now, what differentiates this one you're seeing on the right to the drawing on the left is that this on the left was done with actually probably the same pens, fine liners of different, of different line weights. But instead of using Copic markers, which are like watercolor pens to add the colors, I made it digital. So you're able to drop in some leaf textures and some different colorways. But I found it amazing how there's some similarity between these, these two methods. And yeah, I just love it. This, I mean, I could easily frame these things. It's so beautiful. Such well done drawings. And it's, it's not just that. It's, it's the context behind the drawings. I mean, look, you have pandas in a lab putting it together and... Yeah, so I like the watch, don't get me wrong. But the story behind it and the sketching and the work, it's just it's just so nice. Anyway, I mean, the movements that go into these pieces, we know it's superb watchmaking. Sadly, MBNF, unless they're doing, as far as I know, unless they're doing partnerships, um, <laughs> Kinder's Egg, T-shirts, I don't know what's going on, Samurai. Uh, I see uh, Onaps, welcome to the show, Zhao. And many more of you, Don, Don Johnson. Oh, it's good having you all here, thank you. I'm just going to get back to this old piece. We've we've chatted about MBNF before. The, the one downside, that at least through an interview that he had, was that um, a lot of his pieces don't sell or become anywhere near as popular unless he is in partnership with someone. I mean, Max Booser and Friends is like the whole the whole process. Yeah, it's just beautiful. It's a really nice watch, and of course, it's, since it's for only watch, it's it's going to a good cause, and there's. Lots to enjoy. I believe the only, walks, only watch auction is happening right now. Maybe someone can correct me. But <laughs> I'm saying love your work. Love your work, Don Johnson. Uh, yeah. But otherwise, the sad thing is some of these web pages aren't going to be as friendly to load and things. But we can try and get you know as clear of a picture as possible. I mean, look at this work that went into these drawings. I can't believe it. You know how long it takes to throw these things together? It's insane. This is like this is like a full three hours worth of illustration just to get all of these lines done. Damn impressive. And it's it's again, it's that whole, you know, the, the simplicity of the white and black contrast, the, the articulating components similar to Uwork models and many others. Can I zoom into this? Maybe I can. Oh, just look at that. Of course, this is like high horology. This is not your simple, easy to consume stuff. Don't worry, we're going to be looking at a few micro brands, Tag Hoyers, and many others later on. I just thought it'd be nice to start the show off with a bit of a, a bit of a bang. And Megan's saying some great collaborations, drawings. Much uh, they used to be much popular in the in the begging. <laughs> okay. I don't know what that means. Um, or they hired high high schoolers to illustrate them. I guarantee you, Samurai, these were not high schoolers who put these together. These these drawings are seriously professional. Trust me, it's it's a lot of work. Huge props for them to nail it the way they did. It's super unnecessary too, and I hope, I really hope that when this watch does go through the auction process and everything, that those drawings accompany it and are a part of the, the handout at the end. I mean, you want to frame these drawings. They are beautiful. Isn't it? Whoa, what did I just do? Oh, no, no, no. This is the thing. It's very technical, and I don't know how to leave this page now. Uh, hold on. Anything to get? How do I get out of here? escape that'll do it right this is the only downside of getting this this presentation going is that it can get a little bit all over the place with with bits and pieces traska lately Ooh, samurai that's a goodie okay so let's we carry on through this is pretty uh hardcore let's start with the glasuta cq green i do not want to subscribe to a newsletter glasuta cq green now we've chatted about the standard CQ diver, and it's it's an interesting proposition. The one downside is they are very pricey for what we could say as a typical skin diver. Of course, you're getting awesome watchmaking. And question in the chat: Should I leave this ID at the bottom, or should I get rid of it? Uh, comment Y for leave and N for what? Comment comment 
yes for stay and why for stay and for get rid of. That would be nice to know. I don't want to see it. I don't know if it's good that it's blocking the the watches in the corner. Yeah, so you're getting in-house movement. There are lots of little factors about this watch. It's great. And this color works extremely well for it. Not all of us are fans of green. So Julian says no. Thomas says no. Ashley says no. Okay, so you guys don't mind seeing the little little bouncing avatar strobe. That's okay. Okay, cool. I, I, I get Thank you, everyone. That's, that's good. Sam Ray says yes. It's a unanimous no by the sounds. I think there's two yeses. Okay, I'm going to keep it. I'll keep it on for a little while. If it does get in the way, we can, we can get rid of it. So what they've done here, I think, is great. No faux patina, nothing that gives it any sense of age. It looks a bit more modern. Uh, welcome, Joe. It's good having you here. And Steve's also saying yes. So we've got a handful of yeses. Um, F1 PT says, uh, generally think the price of the Panda went for is an absolute bargain. I'm interested in knowing the price. I didn't. I mean, I've only just heard recently from from Megan that um, this whole show is going on, but only watch is happening and the bids are happening. So I'd love to know if that's the case. Uh, hold on, I thought I was going to get rid of it. Uh, pull it over the duck. I don't know what that means. Anyway, so yeah, great looking watch. As you know, the first 20, 30 minutes of the show, I'm trying to get my head into the game. So bear with me getting the coffee in the system. This green is an excellent green. The olive drab is clean. It's very subtle. It's not in your face. It's not bright and Hulk-ish, you know? And I think they've done a good job with this watch. They kept the size a good size, 39.5. Of course, it's not for everyone. But what makes up for its smaller size is that legibility on the dial, which makes it excellent. No faux patina, so it doesn't age the watch, like I said. Ceramic bezel has all the skin diver properties. And we are now seeing the skin diver feature being used across the board. I mean, look, we're getting a yacht master with a NATO strap. We're getting a titanium, by the sounds of things, titanium Pelagos now with integrated tabs and these skin diver style cases, you know, where the, the lugs have these little integrated components on the sides. It's an interesting thing. And another thing I wanted to mention during this is the talk about green watches and where the green watch is going. <laughs> As you will see, I selected like five or six that we can talk through and also want to do a video about green watches at one stage. Cool looking piece. I think the one downside is they are pretty highly priced as watches um, for what they offer. A lot of people are saying that they prefer discounts for these if they can. But then, you know, to each their own. I, I've never been a fan of the double glasuta on the dial, but that's what they always do. They always have this glasuta element. That's like their stamp of approval. Just questioning, how could they fix that? Maybe they replace this with automatic on the side and leave the glasuta original at the top. Still. It's, I also love the render of this. It's beautifully done. Getting back in the chat, I'm sorry that I'm missing you all. I'm still trying to keep in touch with what's going on on the big screen and fan of, I think a lot of us are. The, the thing is, with La Suta, a lot of their pieces can be hit or miss. You know, they have the 60s, they have the 70s model. They have the CQ, which I think is probably one of their top sellers. They have the Panorama Date. I think that's what's called the Panomatic Date. That thing is great. Um, great watchmaking. I mean, La Suta, just Glasuta in general, the way they address their pieces, they all feel so similar. They have their own established style that doesn't feel Swiss, if you know what I mean. Hitting the coffee some more. Green is the new orange. Black is the new blue. Or blue is the new black. I know, right? Colors. Uh, this, is, this is another trend that we seem to be getting on. And we will be looking at Patek in a little while and discussing their um, perpetual chrono that they brought out, that flyback. It was beautiful. And, you know, in stainless steel with a green dial and everything, that'll be a part of the show later on. Uh, sorry, again, that I'm missing everyone here. I see Abdul joining us. Welcome. And Koji, many more of you. Thank you all for joining in, kicking back, listening in. Black Dragon approves. <laughs> yeah, it's a goodie. Uh, Mark II from Manhattan. Welcome. And I think it was, I saw something about the Chronomaster Sport. That's going to be in here later. We're going to chat about. Panda went for 680. Whoa. Wow. 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 That is a very reasonable price. I really hope the artwork went with it. As bad as it is to say, I would probably love the artwork more than the watch, which is weird. Uh, I just wish more manufacturers would get around to, to getting, oh, look at the loom. More brands need to loom their bezels. Come on. That's another debate, whether or not we're going to see the Pelagos fully loomed when it's released. I have this feeling in the back of my mind that we will. The fully loomed bezel with all the points highlighted. Oh, it's going to look great. I'm really excited about it. More Belveni down the hatch. Uh, yeah. Again, I'm going to try and keep my head because there are fireworks going on behind me. 
it's hella distracting. You're like trying to keep in rhythm and you get these huge explosions going on. Uh, I recommend Mossburn. Oh, oh, Mossburn is a whiskey, right? There, there was a, there's a manufacturer out there. I can't remember the name, but it's a micro brand that emulates the style of dive watch. Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. I remember seeing it. Awesome design. And it did have like a Moss name to it, I think, if I remember. Mossburn uh, is, is a session whiskey, just about the best be best, best entry-level offering from a distillery. Don't even get me started on the cask strength stuff. Oof. I, you know, I'm still such a, a novice at this, so I'll absolutely take that in. I love listening back to the show, bits and pieces. I'll definitely write that one down. 6-2 MAS case, kind of, yes. I mean, that's that's a part of it. Technically, Blanc Pond Bathyscaphe case too, and and these skin divers, they they were a weird bunch, a weird bunch of watches that came out through the the mid to late sixties. But I think what they've done here is awesome. This this dial layout is a bit divisive too. I would say it's definitely not for everyone. It can be a little bit all over the show. The numerals, um, the date complications, well integrated. I think the size is nice. Open six at the bottom is good. Far far too expensive, Paul. I mean, that's the one thing we all talk about. A lot of people get these watches, try their hardest to get them at, at a discount. And it, it can be done. I mean, these watches are still available. You can get the standard black dial models. You can get the, the faux patina variants. But the 30, I think what they've just done so well, why I appreciate it so much, is that 39.5 size. Its proportions are bang on perfect. Uh, they, of course, they made a bigger version with a large date. And I think that was a 41 or 42. Seiko SPB 143. Yeah. Same same case, exactly, exactly the same case. Welcome, Curtis. Great to have you here. Better late than never. You're not late. My, my brain is still trying to catch up with the show starting. And carrying on through, yeah, everyone's just cast. I don't know what's happening. I see Mark at watch, watch. Welcome, watch, Pappy. And many more of you that I'm missing. Oh, God, I see Orange Hand. Right, I'm going to carry on through. It's a great piece. Next up, I saved. What was the next watch? Let's see if I can get this to fit the screen. Funny enough, this caught my attention. Now, this show is varied. I wanted to try and make it varied. I don't know why the watch isn't showing up here. Uh, there we go. That'll have to do. Uh, yeah, so we've chatted about Bremont in the past, I think, and also their um, their new movement that they've just done in-house. I'd love to hear a bit more about that if you'd like to mention it in the in the chat. Yeah, Ga Garish, shoot. Well, welcome, uh, Forbin. So chat about Bremont for a while. This watch caught my attention. I did not look at the specs, so forgive me if I'm getting a few things wrong. Grade 5 titanium case. I love the colors. It reminds me of that uh, IWC that came out, the, the Mojave or the Mojave, if you're sophisticated. Uh, it's got a, I don't know if this is their in-house caliber or if they're still using, I think it's an ETA-based caliber that they modify. But it's a really interesting combination. And it looks like Bremont is making, this is literally the same photograph repeated again and again. Anyway, Vegas can't be choosers. Uh, this is pretty nice. You can look at the specs. I think Bremont is starting to actually make some, some headway through their presenting and through some of their pieces. The whole compressor case design is quite nice. I think the crowns are a little bit too big, but then it's for a pilot, so it needs to be operated well. Uh, I do really like this feature of the... <laughs> I could zoom into both. <laughs> what is going on? Uh, I really do like this feature of the pull tab. Pull, pull tab as the uh, counterbalance, anti-shock automatic. And now, of course, I can't zoom out of this. Let's try. There we go. That works. Just bear with me. How can I be getting tongue-tied 20 minutes into the show? Try and say that 10 times. Uh -huh. Hitting the whiskey again. Just got to get those early minute moves going. I don't think I'll be traveling in the desert anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't even know the specification about this watch. It's it's true application. Beyond endurance, I mean, as far as I know, they do a hell of a lot of testing with these pieces. Of course, the big one is the, the G-forces they experience on the wrists of pilots as they eject out of planes. I really hope this was not in the air and it was on the ground. Uh, yeah, to each their own. Bremont, I think one thing that's always been dividing people, again, we've chatted about the, the Glasuta and their pricing, but Bremont, I mean, they're pricing their stuff high, like as high as Omega's and many other pieces today. The question is, if you're getting a modified ETA, as far as I know, it's a modified ETA, is it worth that price? You're just paying for the brand name? These are, I mean, Bremont is, is huge in the UK, by the way. Bremont and Christopher Ward, 
the advertising and the marketing going on. I mean, you see it on ITV and all the big channels here. So they are definitely, oh, here we can actually have a look at the movements. Hold on. Anti-shock. Yeah, they don't tell you what the movement is, but that that kind of looks ETA-ish. I don't know. I'm not a movement junkie, as most of you probably know. I think the aesthetic's pretty nice. I dig how they've done the texture on the side of the case. Always liked this. I think they call it the Supermarine, how they did the lugs on those. And I'm going to catch up with you in the chat again. Let me just get myself sorted here. Uh, let's see. I like it when they are uh, all gray. Hmm. I have a Brumont, makes six or eight cups. <laughs> I mean, that's the perfect name for a coffee maker. It really is a perfect name. Uh, uh, and I'm missing you all in the chat. It's, it's, uh, let's see, Black Dragon. I love this channel. Thank you, Black Dragon. I mean, we try to do our best. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's nice. I really love this show. It's not a show for everyone. It's a very chilled time when we can just catch up. But I do also love just sharing the outliers of pieces that don't necessarily get the attention. And of course, after the show in the comments, I will um, leave a link to all the timestamps if you want to look at the pieces. Um, know someone who tried this on and was very impressed by this Bremon, but still felt it was overpriced. Yeah, Marco, I mean, that's always going to be the downside of this piece. It's it's the pricing. Awesome aesthetics. I must say, like, it's you can see immediately when you look at it, it's it's a pilot-styled watch. The, the numerals everywhere has a bit of IWC to it. The sword hands are great, excellent length. Second hand, I'm not too keen on with this accented red. I also think the Bremont logo is great. I think the propeller works nicely there. Again, this this pull tab is a very cool feature. So overall, it's a nice looking watch and yeah, deserves some credit. I think the color scheme works great. I think more brands should be playing around with this, this khaki contrast and of course being grade five titanium, it's super lightweight. It's a bit more hardcore, a bit more technical. Uh, I don't know if I should open all these little tabs to look at case back and yeah, we didn't have to do that. Yeah, nice piece. That's the next one in the list. Just really motoring through to the third watch on the list. Let's see what it is. I did have a few like pretty funny ones. Oh, this is a goodie. This is a goodie. So we've just moved from MBNF to Bremont, and now we're looking at the Chanel. I'm trying to remember the name. It's a big name. It's called the Monsieur uh, Superleggera, right? Yeah. This watch we've. I think we might have chatted about before. Maybe not. I think we did a couple of bizarre standout watches of last the last quarter this is probably one of my favorite chanel watches i've ever seen by far it is such such a good looking design so you've got a jump hour you've got a central seconds and then you have your minutes at the top i'll zoom in for a bit closer for you what makes this one stand out a bit more are the accent colors the texture on the dial movements great i think this is the same man i don't know if chanel has an in-house manufacturer or if they work with the same group that builds movements for makers like Hermes and all the others. It's a very slick looking watch. And the price is also pretty decent, all things considered, which I think is worth looking at and discussing. Just the colors. I mean, red and black just always works on a piece. It gives it such a, a sporty touch. Beautiful finish. I mean, we've got 30, 30 jewels. Uh, I love the balance. It looks well considered. Not everything's just thrown in there. It's, it's all balanced out nicely. And it's the reading experience that actually caught my attention the most to this piece. Uh, we can chat about, I don't know, the main attraction is the jumping hour display at the six o'clock. No, it's not. The main attraction is how easy the watch is to read from bottom up. Very seldom do you find a jump hour watch that's almost natural in the way you can read it. Once the price RC is asking, I'm going to have a look now. 70 to 72 hour power reserve, uh, four hertz movement, which is great. I think the price is like 29 or 39K. Swiss francs, if I can find it, 36 or oh, 36 euros. I'm going to try and highlight this. 36 euros, I think, if I remember right. But it's called the, the Chanel Monsieur um, Superleggera. That's the one. Yeah, still waking up to this. It's been a while since we've done one of these, these shows. So it's, it's weird. Really great watch. It's I, I love I love finding these sorts of outliers where – Design speaks more than the brand or anything like that. The numerals, uh, the way you read that that minute hand at the top. So it's basically like a um, you wouldn't call it a retro punt, would you? No, retrograde. That's it. It's a retrograde. The minute retrograde moving back to. Oh, I think it's so good. Got a bit confused with the name. Mezzanine, welcome. You think? <laughs> did you Google it? I don't know if he's talking to me. Uh, FP Jean, is that the the Chanel FP Jean? You know what, Julian? Good call. It looks kind of FB Jean-ish, right? It does. Um, and so many more of you that are missing. Why, why, why me? Greetings from Germany. Welcome. 
love your thoughts knowledge ah i wouldn't say knowledge just like just like i don't know ramblings more than anything yeah great roman gutier um, marco's mentioning i really don't know the movement if this was a fratello watch article that i pulled up on it we could go through running the article itself but that might take a little bit too much time it's a 42 millimeter watch but i think what works about it are the lugs they're really short so it ties in nicely yeah just a great package sleeper stealth it's not all bright and gold and in your face it's it's slick has a bit of a louboutin system going on at the back there with the red leather on the strap yeah so it's got this casualness to it i wonder what the case thickness is probably like 11 12 maybe with the crystal mm, it's it's clean i could have a look movement aspirations they talk about skeletons and caliber 2 i don't know if that helps anyone Again, one downside is that I'm not a, a movement junkie, so I'm probably the worst person to ask on the subject, but just beautiful. I love the texture that they've added in, the way they've framed everything, that there's this rigidity and, and geometry to the numerals, to the way everything is boxed. Uh, the cutouts, it just looks well considered. Very seldom you see watches that have everything linear, you know? So often we see these high complication movements with just stuff thrown around everywhere. Asymmetry works, don't get me wrong, but when you read this watch from the bottom up, it just is easy. 410, and it's what, 50 seconds going? Nice. Hitting the coffee again. You're not even slightly late, Rizab. It's been half an hour. <laughs> and yeah, time time flies. Uh, extra pair of shoes I could buy with the savings from not buying this. Magazine. I mean, that's another thing. You could actually buy. I mean, Chanel offers quite a lot, and it's not always watches. So, I mean, yeah, it's pretty cool. Interesting watch. Definitely one that I think is worth addressing. Design-wise, it's a winner. I don't know if this was shortlisted at GPHG. I think it might have been. I did not keep track of the competition. Maybe we can discuss GPHG as a bit of a background thing while the show is going on. I'd love to know your thoughts about some of the winners. And yeah, it's been an interesting, interesting ride. The Chronomaster Sport as the winner in the one category. I mean, like, yeah, it's... We all have our different opinions about how GPHG operates. If it is a cash, a cash transaction thing, and if it has any validity in the bro in the broader scheme of things, we don't know what the judges look at. At the end of the day, Q Maestro is asking how much it costs. We we I think we we landed on something like thirty six thousand euros, which is pricey. I mean, let's not get up, let's not kid ourselves. Hold on a sec. This is an amazing alpha. This is called the um. Oh, I looked at it the other day. What's the name? It's so good. Pin, Pin and Farina did this. And this is the Roadster version. They did a handful of these. What's the car called? Uh, I had it on the top of my head the other day. Superleggera. I don't know why they paired this car with it. Do they even share the name? It's a beautiful Alpha. Uh, I don't know. Disco Volante. That's the one. Disco Volante. Really cool. Which means Flying Saucer. No? Flying Saucer. That's the That's the name. I love, if you look at the heritage of it, I would highly recommend open up a tab in Google, look up uh, Alpha Disco Volante, and you'll see the development of this car and how they threw it all together. It's it's basically an 8C that they just put a new body on and sculpted everything. I think it's handmade. It's a, it's an aluminum body, so even cooler. Yeah, this I've never seen it with a, with a roof, without a roof, though. And light blue, you normally see them in red. Yeah, Disco Volante, it was a classic car that they made a long time ago, but they've brought it back this is not a new car though it's 2016 it came out okay enough about cars because that'll definitely bore people to death next up we have oh gerard perigo i'm going through these fast i've, I've highlighted two gerard perigo the both laureatos first the titanium and then the sapphire the sapphire tourbillon no it's a sapphire skeleton probably one of my favorite releases so far this year and this in a similar way to that chanel we just looked at Bear in mind, I said in the beginning of the show that this uh, selection of pieces, they aren't flashy and they don't stand out too much. They have, in a way, we could say they've been reskinned quotations. And it's nothing really new. But I think this one has the subtlety that most Laureatos didn't have. The titanium, lightweight, I think it was worked so nicely for the case design. Too big, uh, Kumash was mentioning. Yeah, that's that's definitely something we can talk about. Uh, wheels are small. Uh, Superleggera are an Italian. Yes, yes. So that's another thing, Julian. So how did they get the Superleggera name for the Chanel? But they're talking about the Disco Volante from Alpha, which is a Pininfarina design. Don't know about that. I think they're just comparing apples to oranges in a way. Barquetta, I think that might have been the one. 
Alpha, got to say, Alpha had the most, be- they have the most beautiful design house. They are just exceptional. So many good cars in their back catalog. Uh, if you're a design nut, I think Alpha is the one maker that you can always look at and just be so impressed by. Um, Ferraris are cool. But then Ferrari does tend, especially nowadays, to go a little bit over the top with just the jagged edges and the sharpness and the the vents and the intakes. Uh, Alpha keeps it simple. You know, the Julia and the Julietta and you know their amazing track cars that they made. Some of the most beautiful designs of all time. So this watch is good. Uh, it's got a rubber strap by the looks of things. I think the integration of the strap into the case has been done well. It's yeah, mixed bag, though. Because on one hand, you look at it and think, this is not a GP. It looks a little bit too safe, a little bit too simple. It looks a bit G-Shock-ish, don't you think? Uh, but I also do think what they've done so nicely is just kept it subtle. No polishing on the edges. I think they're using a new movement. The GP3300, if that means anything. 28,800, 28, sorry, 28,000. Uh, let's see anything else. 218 parts, if that piques your interest. But just nice. I think the way they have, yeah, they've kept it subtle. I mean, just things I haven't noticed is that the the batons themselves are actually sunken in to the dial. So it's got a bit of a sandwich dial arrangement to it. It's got a bit of a fume finish, the nice texture in the end. Nothing is highly polished apart from the edge of the bezel, which is a nice touch and the side of the case. It just integrates well. I think it's it's casual enough. It's not offensive to the eye. And it's also, yeah, quite a sleeper. Reinforced rubber strap. I mean, they really go deep with this stuff. Fluoro, carbons, and oh, geez. Question about prices and stuff. Uh, 230. Oh, I forgot these are limited editions. Of course, they're limited editions. 230 pieces and another 230 pieces. 9.4. I'm sure you'll be able to find some good discounts on these pieces. It's a 44 mil diameter. I did not know that. I thought it was 42. Yeah, learning along the way with all of you here for sure. Also, I, I didn't mention this, is just that little gasket on the crown that makes it a bit more sports-oriented. Yeah, nice-looking piece. I see Justin EDC joining. Welcome. Victorinox, good shot there, Michael. This does look like a Victorinox. Like, bang on. We actually had one on a, on a live show a couple of weeks back, months back. Um, yeah, that's maybe where they got their inspiration. I think, I think they actually compared it to this watch. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Great shot there. I mean, yes. In, in almost every way. I think what gives it away the most are the, the lugs and the crown guards. Uh, that integration looks so on the nose. Very interesting. So so this watch stood out to me because I liked the subtlety of it. And next to it, we're going to have a look at the, the Sapphire Skeleton later on. The Skeleton GP is by far my favorite. I think the way they do their movements, just beautiful. And in there, you'll see a bit of a different side to this watch and its design. 44 is pretty huge for this for this watch. Uh, especially with that integrated style case, it would probably wear even bigger. You know, typical to APs and, and Pateks and those. Uh, generally, the bigger the size, the more it wears, you know, wears a millimeter or two larger. Julian's saying, do you think after Seiko got a GPHG prize for their white birch, oh, it might be branching out to new territories. I did not know. By the way, please tag me in the chat if you want to get my attention. Just at ID guy or hashtag. <laughs> yeah, I called it a G-Shark. Yeah, I'm going with it. Um, very interesting. I didn't know that they won a prize uh, for the, the White Birch. It's a good-looking watch. It's actually great to see that they're getting that recognition, uh, especially at GPHG. I don't even know if there have been winners in the past before in those in those categories. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing. It's, it's one of the most hotly spoken about pieces. So many of us are looking at Grand Seiko for that, especially for the dial finishing, which is something that's become a household name with their brand, which is pretty nice. Okay, and scrolling down again, I'm missing you here. I'm thinking 44 is way too big. Then I remembered I'm wearing a 44. So, yeah, we're talking about the um, if we're talking about the Seiko, like Seiko turtles in general. The turtle 44 mil is the best 44 mil case there is. It's just amazing because it feels like a 40. <clears throat> it's all down to how the lugs integrate. I think that's probably what you're referring to, Nefarion. Um, Yeah, I've experienced a Willard, and gotta say. Cases are amazing. Right, we're going to move on next. This is a great piece. Love the subtlety to it overall. Let's see what we can do in the next one. Oh, this is a goodie. Let me try and pull this up. I've got a notepad here, which will make my life a bit easier, I hope, if I can get this out. Let's see. Copy and paste it in here. 
Yeah, so I don't know what we would call this watch. It is a tribute watch. It is a bit of an homage to a classic, a Ren Type 20. We love our Type 20s. At least some of us here do, I think. So what, what do we start with this? I'm sure most of you know the history of Type 20s. You know my fixation and my my love of their designs began with the Hanharts and the 417s. And you know, it was a typical German design that became very well known post Second World War used by French military, especially the Aeronautique Nouvelle and French Navy in general, their pilots. We went through a few stages of how the big eye evolved, you know, from the sterile dial. Uh, we had Vixes, Oracost, so many names. Just, just you know, Longines had that big eye. Um, of course, Breguet, sterile Breguets. Then you had a, a two a two register. You also had a three register big eye version. And then just after we we had the glory days of the Type Twenty watches. So we then moved to this era where you start seeing the more skin diver ish ish case. So this is something we can pretty much piece together as belonging to late 50s, early 60s, in a way. Hitting the water again, hold on a sec. I can see it very clearly that it has that that type um, of skin diver styling to it with the squared off, squared off lugs. And I love the, the bicompacts arrangement. It's just typical. If, if you know your Type 20 watches, you'll know that this is one that you know, speaks the language. Rotating bezels, nice. Now, as far as this watch goes, I again, I love the design of it, but I don't know what they've thrown into it with regards to movements and everything. If it's a Valjou, if it's, uh, I don't know. So we talk about Dodin and so many others. Breguet, of course. Undone did one of these. I remember seeing that. That was pretty funny. So we could call this a resurgence. Actually, I have a few in store for us to chat about. Resurgence watches like Tornag Ravel and the Bolivar Mill ships and other pieces. I just think the design is so good. Watch by design. I was so pleased to see another Type 20s uh, pilot's watch from the 50s reissued. Yeah, Breguet will always be my favorite. I mean, how can we not love Breguet Type 20s? They are just insane. I so wish we had that as a more accessible watch today. Uh, hand winding Le Jouperet caliber. I don't know if they, you know, they're definitely not using it in this one, I don't think. Uh, pricing availability. Yeah. So pretty fair pricing. Uh, we don't know the movement, but just look, bear with me. There have been a couple of changes to this watch over time. I think the first one that debuted had a tropical dial, which definitely grabbed a lot of people's attention. And this is now their most current. I think pre-orders are available for this watch. I just think it's so good. You just can't not love. It has it all. It's got the, the elegance of a chronograph, but it's also a field watch. And it's got the size that you want for a watch too. I just wonder what the movement is. A minor disadvantage. I'm guessing they're talking about the movements. No, no. Availability. That's the disadvantage. Availability. Thanks, Fratello. Anything else? Is it a column wheel? I can't read that. Maybe someone can help. There is mention about Le Jupere in the chat. Yes, yeah, so the Tropical is limited. There were, there were a few. I think there were two models that were limited, and this one's also coming out soon. This is probably also going to be made in limited supply. And we're seeing this across the board. We see uh, Nevada Gretchen bringing out their chronos again and dive watches. Uh, they're doing so well. And it's, you know, you're getting that vintage aesthetic. We've so spoken about it so many times. The vintage aesthetic, vintage vibe, but it's a modern watch. So you can wear it. You can beat the snot out of it and it'll work. Thank you for the Samurai. Oh, you're on points. Please tag me, Samurai, and I can get this quicker. So it's the caliber AM1. Le Jupere, hand round, column wheel. has a flyback. Fantastic. Why wouldn't they? They should mention, uh, I think they're just keeping with tradition, but I mean, you want to put flyback on the base of the dial to let everyone know. That's that's an achievement. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I think the one downside to this watch that's not for everyone is the case design. The squared off shape is very typical to the era when it came out, but it's definitely not the traditional Type 20 aesthetic that we love. So bear that in mind. But the dial itself. Also, another one to look at is, of course, Hanard 417. Excellent value prop. I think that uses a Salita, hand wound Salita movement. Such a good-looking watch. It's 42 mils in size, got good presence, and that is the the originator. That's what started this whole trend. So pretty, pretty good. Loving a unique piece. Oh, Clam Walker, welcome. Yeah, there are. I mean, we're doing everything. We're looking at micro brands, Tag Heuer, all sorts. Of course, high ends like Lunga later on. So nice selection. I was, I wanted it to be more of a, not so much a discovery session, but a session where we can just talk over a couple of pieces that are worth looking at. Definitely worth looking at. Aura costs are beautiful. They are. I mean, yeah. I, if I had all the money in the world, I would be going after Type 20s, vintage Type 20s for days. <laughs> I would be having a full selection available.
put that in a drawer somewhere. Uh, yeah, being being classified as like a collector of a certain style of watch, type 20 collector, definitely one to think about. And not doing great. They are for sure. And the big eye, what's going on? The Longines big eye is now going up in price. <laughs> the titanium model and yeah, I don't know. Anyway, Oran, great watch. There's so many. I've done too many videos on these watches. Like the, the big eye covers a lot of this, the, the review that I did. Um, watches of the French Armed Forces covers all of these in a section about the big, the, the type 20s in general, their background and history. Yeah. Well worth looking at. Study up the history of the of the Type 20 design because it's it's amazing. How much does this run? Justin asks. I think they said about three and a half k euro, and that's because it's using a, an excellent movement, flyback, and everything. Okay, let's move on. Next up, what do we have? I did have a few funny. Oh, here we go. Okay, I wanted to talk about this watch again because it's one of the pieces that has definitely. Hold on a sec. I didn't. That's funny. I didn't actually type it down. Uh, let's move across here to Torneck Ravel quickly. Now, I think most of us know the story behind this watch. Uh, Gear Patrol covered it, I think. Most of us know the story behind this watch and that Mark II, the, the owner of Mark II watches, basically brought this watch back to life again. I find it just fascinating. And in a way, I wanted it to all line up with this theme of the reissue watch. So we just had a look at the Iran. This is a much more affordable proposition. Uh, okay, sorry, missing you in the chat again. Meng is talking about vintage type 20s. Easy and inexpensive to service. Yeah, they, they have oh, so good. There's just so many things to love about them. The hardest thing is to find one in true original condition, I've heard. Because the type 20s, they, they, lots of them went and had replacement crowns put on, replacement hands. Uh, yeah, services in general can can detract the value of the watch. And just the case backs, there's so many things to love. We could talk about them for days. Tonic Ravel, I did a video about this a few months back, and it's still a watch that's been sticking in my mind. It's using a Seiko, I think it's NH35 movement. It's nothing special from the movement front, but it's a workhorse. It's made to be a workhorse. And the fact that they have reintroduced this classic design, but added the modern twist to it. I don't know if they've given us do we have any old? We don't have any original images. Come on. Let's see if we can find something. Worn and wound. Can you give me something? Let's see. Maybe not. Hmm. It's weird when uh, nothing. Well, let's just bear in mind. They made original vintage watches back in the day. There's an awesome story behind Tornick Ravel and how the watches were smuggled into the United States. But what I like about this is that it's not sticking to a formula that we're going to have a look at in a second. I need to find the vintage because this is going to really irritate me. Uh, vintage. I'll pull up Google Images while we're at it. Why not? What I really like about this watch next to the one that we're going to look at in a second, let me just zoom in, is that the one on the left is the latest. The one on the right is the original. This one feels so like up to date up to standard, up to par, you know, next to what so many brands would do, which is just throw patina on, uh, keep the colors relatively the same. I really like that this watch in particular is going down the road of making it look like something that belongs in today's day and age and doesn't look like something from the 1950s and 60s. Uh, they've done it so well. I mean, you've got your, your water uh, ingress indicator at the base. You've got the typeface is all correct. The colors all match up nicely. BGW9 Loom. Excellent strap, sandblasted, bead blasted case. Mentioning about the movement. Thank you, everyone. Let me get into the chat and have a look. Uh, the mill ships, that's coming up next. Don't worry, Raymond, it's coming up next. Um, movement made in Japan. Uh, so it's a, it's an S, oh my goodness, X06R35. Okay, got it, got it. I think I'm NE15 movement. Bill's company time their watches to in all four directions. Thank you for that, Caleb. Yeah, you guys are just so good with your comments. I can't keep up. I cannot keep up with you. Talking about Breguet, will you be covering the classic Tourbillon anniversary today? A massive release. I didn't save it. No, I didn't. Oh, no. The Tourbillon was beautiful, wasn't it? I can pull it up. I think at the end of the show, we can definitely pull it up. Or maybe I can. I don't know. Definitely want to talk about it. It's, it's just the simple. It's an anniversary model, right? I'm going to pull it up. Just before I forget, I'm going to open up a tab. Let's get it up because, yes, it's worth talking about. I know exactly the model. I seek. Uh, it's a tourbillon. I'm just going to say 2021. I'm sure we'll get it. Uh, let's have a look. Breguet. 
excuse me, ladies and gents, this one is definitely, oh, thanks. Who, who mentioned this? I think it was, yeah, Mr. Abhishev, thank you for this. Definitely worth talking about. If this is the model, extra platinum. I'm surprised this isn't in platinum, but we will have a look at it. Uh, very important model. Yeah, so getting back to this watch, one of the best micro brand releases. I don't know what you would call this watch if it is a micro brand, if it is uh, like a resurgence of a maker. So many enthusiasts are going to get on board with this piece. You can choose between aluminium bezels. You can choose between, you know, uh, you have acrylic bezels, fully loomed. I love it. I think the aesthetic is what stands out to me so much. The size, strap configuration. Yeah. I've spoken about this watch so many times. It's also on the channel. Maybe I'll link that in the corner of the screen too. Such a cool story behind these watches. It's a sleeper. It is a sleeper in this category. If you don't know the story, just really briefly, is that um, America had an act in, in uh, place during the 50s by American Act, basically meaning that they couldn't source any of these things from uh, Europe, any other part of the world. So Alan Tornick struck up a deal with Blanc Pond to create a watch and rebrand the dial with his surname and Ravel being the anagram of Villa Ray, which was, you know, the hometown of Blanc Pond. So technically it's, it's got his name and it's got Swiss made on it, which is cool. I just had a hell of a deja vu just saying that as weird, uh, but everything's just correct. There's no Swiss made at the base. And the idea is you keep it Swiss made with that name, but then you put us underneath just to get past borders. Uh, they only made a, like a hundred of them for, for the Navy. And these went out to Vietnam. And once the war finished, many, many of these were destroyed as just a part of getting rid of, uh, military components, military equipment. And a couple got stolen and taken home and, and put aside and managed to get away from all of that. And they, they are the most, I would say, the most rare and expensive dive watches in the world to buy in the vintage marketplace uh, for good reason. I think the story is amazing. This is the kind of thing, if you're a super collector, this is the kind of watch that you want just to be able to wear this out one evening and say, yeah, you want to know what makes this watch cool? And I don't know why it's all pixelated, but you get the idea. It's just, it's a charming thing. Longpan and their dive watches. We've said this so many times before. They were so above everyone else. I know there's so much criticism often about the bezel being too fat and it just not looking correct. But this is the watch that really termed the modern dive watch that we see today. I mean, this began the trend of the rotating bezel, the legibility, the, all of those aspects were factored in. The presence on the wrist, worn over wetsuits and everything. It was... And of course, French Navy, they were the ones who experimented with these pieces. We see that time and time again. Tudor Pelagos, we are about to see released, also experimented with the French Navy. That's just, you know, part of it. And catching up in the chat, once again, Samurai, Blancpain 50 Fathoms, Bathyscaphe Grade 23 Titanium. Oh, yeah, that full titanium model. I can't talk about Blancpain and the Bathyscaphe. It's just one more. I don't, I'll, get, I'll get very... Uh, negative i think if i talk about that watch i need to do a design critique of the bathyscaphe not everything that blanc pond makes is great i know there are a couple of bathyscaphe owners in the chat uh i'm sorry but i really don't like the bathyscaphe at all uh the uh, this design is just beautiful right i'm going to carry on uh, abdul's asking looks, looks cool how much does it cost i think these are like a thousand dollars they are that they, they when they went up for sale they were about a thousand dollars and they're going to be having orders again for them again so really Look up Tornick Ravel. I think as far as a dive watch goes, it's the epitome of what a dive watch should be represented as, especially as a mill spec, in quotations, piece. Yes, he was. Blanc Pomp President was a diver, and it was because of his insight that he basically helped direct not only the marketing, but also the design of it. He wanted a bezel that could turn. It's, it's so good. I love Blanc Pomp's story. So for all the hate the brand gets, in a lot of ways because their prices are quite extreme and their watches don't sell as, as well as they used to and stuff. Movements are incredible and the story behind their original dive watch, 900. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Megan. Uh, okay, right. Chat about this enough. And I think the next is the mill ships, I hope. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's chat about the Bolivar mill ships. I wonder if I should pull up articles or not. Uh, this one has been, so what I, what I like doing with this talk is, uh, Funny enough, my web browser does not like Hodinky at all. When I click on Hodinky, I get this. And when I click advanced, it doesn't let me actually hop, hop in. So unfortunately, Hodinky is out of the running for their images being displayed. Let's see if there are any other places. It looks, our oh, blog to watch had one. I don't know if they have the watch in hand. 
there have been some good talks. Uh, maybe I can just zoom into the images. I don't know. Bolivar Mill Ships. What makes this watch a great value prop is, again, the price. It's under the Bolivar name. It's based on a prototype that was never actually manufactured, which is nice. So it's got some cool history, and we can see immediately the similarities, and they pulled that reference from the watch that we just saw. Yeah, the browser's doing me a solid. I know, right? I know, I know. Jean-Claude Beaver, your PC knows what's up. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, um, two versions. Yes, so they did a Miyota SW200. Interesting, Raymond. So they had two, okay, two variants, right. I want to try, I have to find an article, some proper images. This sucks. I can't get into her dinky. Maybe I can for a blog to watch, but the sad thing is I won't. I don't think I'll have any live images. We have some Reddit shots that could maybe help. But yeah, so there's been lots of talk. The, the, the limited edition came in a, a diving helmet, which is quite cool, bit of a novelty. Standard model came in a box. A lot of people are saying that the standard model is actually more true to form, <clears throat> I think, because it doesn't have Swiss made at the bottom of the dial, if I remember right, and that's true to its, its history. Yeah, but again, it's one of these watches that used the Tornik Ravel format, I think, in the 50s. Not Actually, it was a Blancpain idea in the 50s, uh, but it never was produced around the time. Same time period, but this one wasn't adopted. Uh, let's see, Abdul saying, looks like summer 22 will be full of diver mill spec homages. Yeah, right, right. This watch is already out, by the way. You can you can pick these up. They're excellent value for money, I think, what you're getting. I believe it's an, it's a Hamilton-based movement. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but again, what I just I appreciate so much about these releases. We chatted about design and sketching at one stage. I love the fact that these watches are now being shown with just the original advertising and, and all that with it. Isn't that cool? I mean, you've got, I love reading this stuff. Like it's a big deal. Tested to 400 feet and it uses a, a nylon strap. And this was such December 1959. This was such a pioneering thing back in the day where today it's just like, yeah, whatever. You know, photoluminescence and all the stuff that we just take for granted was a big deal. I don't even know if these were, these were probably manual wine back then too. Yeah, catching up in the chat. I see Demetrius is joining us. Welcome. Uh, Eric saying Bradley, the CEO of Bolivar, may have got the nod that the US, the US Navy only wanted a short run, hence limited initial run. Are we talking like, we're not talking now, we're talking back in the day, right? It's getting so confusing because now we're getting watches that are being reproduced and sent to the Navy, and <laughs> we're also getting these recreations. So I'm, I'm guessing you mean, you mean back in the day. Uh, and carrying on through, sorry that I'm missing you guys. Just tag me in the chat again if I do miss your comments. Um, 16 mil lug, yes. So that is the one thing that I, all of us were scratching our heads about. It's a 41 mil diameter, but a 16 mil strap width. Yeah, it's a weird one. You can't exactly change the straps very easily. But all things considered, it's nice, you know, the, the one gripe I have is it's, I mean, the aesthetic of the watch, the, the loom and everything, we've seen it so much now. The faux patina and everything is, is everywhere today. Uh, so it's a bit repetitive in that way, but they are paying tribute to that watch. The size and scale, I, yeah, it works in a way. I think it does work in a way. Sometimes I look at watches and think, why not make it an 18 mil lug width to just make the watch feel a little bit less heavy on the wrist, you know? Anyway, carrying on. I see Showcase is joining us. Welcome, Showcase. I don't know what's going on here. I'm trying to get an article open, but Hodinki, Hodinki is not accepted on this computer anymore. It's it's decided it doesn't actually allow doesn't actually allow Hodinki web pages to be shown. So we just have to have to wing it. Have a look. But they've done good stuff. I think they bent the minute's hand and they made it look really true to those traditional styles. Again, what makes it nice is that it's it's all Bolivar. You know, it's in house in a way. Uh, it has that bit of history, the, the little bit of, oh no, did I click that again? Magic Mouse. Uh, it has that little bit of uh, litmus paper at the base. I really dig that. It's so unnecessary, but just adds to that classic styling of, if it did have any water enter it, then that'll change color, true to form. So on one hand, I think the faux patina is a little bit heavy. This coming from someone who owns a 57 Seamaster. On the other hand, I think it's nice that they're paying tribute to a watch that never truly existed. You know, they they're digging into that back catalog and that history. Okay, carrying on through. I think Bolivar are going in a good direction lately. Yeah, they are, Samurai. And it's price dependent. <clears throat> I think they're pricing themselves very nicely. Similar to brands like Hamilton and others, they are finding a good sweet spot 
where other brands like I think Seiko are going a little bit too far with their prices. For, for Seiko, fives and stuff, they're just they're ramping it up threefold. Um, even the CEO is saying we need to go back to formula and start again and simplify our watches and introduce a new language to our pieces. Miyota and Irregular and Salita and Limited. Oh, thank you, Justin. So it is, it's just a Miyota. Okay, okay, got it. But they are, as as Thomas is saying, a Japanese tank. It is. It's a Japanese tank movement. Uh, Seiko and, and Miyota, some of the movements they make are just so good. Next up, what do we have? <laughs> this is not one I don't think we expected. Uh, what is it called? Is it Bell and Ross Diver? I'm going to try and pull it up. Hold on. Where did I save it? Uh, Bell and Ross Diver Blue. Like the reason why I chose this is because it's not something we ever look at. Uh, can I get a good article up for us? Probably not. This is the downside. A lot of these pieces haven't been covered. Bell and Ross will cover it, so I guess we can look at their page. I don't know how good the renders will be. No, I'm going to look and see if I can find Monochrome. Maybe they've done something better. Escapement Magazine. Oh, there's Monochrome. Okay. Let's have a look at this article. Now, Ballon Ross gets quite an interesting rap. <laughs> you know, their designs can be hit or miss. The style of the cases are so true to how they address their watches in general. Hitting the coffee again. I really like what made me, what, what got me onto this watch is I really like how they're using the square case for a dive watch. I find it appropriate. I find it actually works for this piece. Now, the, the whole argument is that the square shape is basically just the instrument cluster, the actual gauge that's been taken out of an airplane. Um, of course, that's where their inspiration came from for most of their pilot pieces. But I find it interesting, and it's something worth looking at. I mean, it's not, <laughs> again, we've gone through all sorts of pieces. I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to just, you know, jump on a bizarre selection of watches today. <clears throat> but this one, I think, is worth our attention. You know, they've got crown guards. It's got a lock naming on the side there, which gives it a bit more of a tooltastic nature. It's got the Pelagos styled rehort that runs along the base. Very instrumental. I like that samurai. The yellow accent on the hour hand is nah, maybe what they could have done is added a bit of a yellow accent on the triangle at the top. It gives you this. Um, I think the one watch that comes to mind is the IWC. <clears throat> what's that model? It's a Jacques Cousteau version. Um, someone help me out. IWC. It's got blue and yellow accents. It's, I see it pretty often. I can't remember the name of it. We'll get there eventually. Um, the, the, of course, it's huge. It has to be huge. Uh, and the and the strap integration is a bit nah, but worth looking at. Let's chat about it. Belly tankers. I mean, there's just so much. It'll match some square dive computers, right? Right? Blends in there. It's just a weird example, but I thought as far as a dive watch goes, it's one that we don't see. How often do we see square dive watches today? Uh, so John Paul Beaver says, I reckon it'll look good on the metal. I'll reserve judgment until it's on the wrist. We're talking about the Ballon Ross or, again, I'm sorry that I'm missing you in the chat, people. Tag me again, and I hope I'll be able to catch you again. Uh, let's see. Uh, gee, there's so much going on. Zin and Zelos, and sorry that I'm missing you guys. So all things, uh, the blue the blue accents work very nicely. I think it's, it's kind of true to form. It's very typical of the dive watch, of the Navy aesthetic and all that. Uh, here here for a break school is breaking me oh marcello marcello <laughs> he's an industrial designer student and he's getting on board with with that harsh life funny enough marcello you're going to appreciate this i'm going to roll back up to the top of the show if i can quickly come on work with me will it do it i don't know yes check it out we work uh oh hold on no it's not going to do it there we go. At the beginning of the show, we were chatting about um, this watch made by MBNF, the, the Panda. And they did some beautiful sketches around the Panda. And I thought I'd dig into the archives. This was a sketch I did a couple of years back. I know the industrial designer will love illustration. This was all um, fine liner and uh, what was it? Paper mate. Paper mate and fine liner with a bit of a white pencil, some shading. And then taking it and adding some some texture and everything there. I used to love doing this stuff. Anyway, let's get back down to the Ballon Ross again. Sorry about that tangent. Uh, we are. All right, back to Ballon Ross. Aquatimer, that's it, Q Maestro. The IWC Aquatimer. This, this watch reminds me of that in a way. Very different way. Uh, okay, carrying on through. I think Megan mentioned she loves... 
<laughs> Belend and Ross, thanks for that, John Claude Beaver. Uh, yeah, Bell and Ross, I, I've actually had some time with the um, the BR01. I think I got to experience that. That's the name. I can't remember. It's that aesthetic. I think it's it's a, like with so many brands, like with Panerai and and those case designs. It's a love it or hate it. Uh, interesting idea with this piece. I don't know about the aluminium bezel. I guess that was cost cutting, maybe saving prices. Looks good though, right? It's, it's so just unlike what we talk about normally. The IWC Aquatimer, it's a goodie. Uh, Wash by design, as in ID, the first blush, this Ross speaks to me. I, uh, I have to see it on my wrist first. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the fact is, we could say things like some of the dividing features on this watch. If we look to the left, the, the rubber strap integration, <clears throat> this looks like a corner cut. I don't know if they do this very often with their with a lot of their pieces, but I've never liked how you build a strap around the, the end link. I guess in a way it works, but it also feels a bit janky. It would probably look a bit better if it didn't have this flank to it. I don't know. But then it also keeps the size down. It doesn't look so heavy. All open to interpretation. Okay. Are there any more interesting images to scroll through? This looks like it's made of bronze. Huh. Might be wrong. Carrying on. Ben and Ross Square GMT. The orange hand. Yeah, that's a good one. That is a really good one, Megan. I like that one a lot. Um, and as far as colors go, look at the black. Black and orange looks fantastic. I really like it. I mean, how often do we say that we like Bell & Ross watches in general? They look so repetitive, you know? This, to me, looks like an instrument. It looks like a, a proper tool dive watch. And the square element gives it that um, X factor that we don't see very often with pieces. Easy change straps. I like that point. Sorry that I'm missing you in the chat again. I've got to try and keep up. I see Showcase chatting with Marco. Bronze plate. Thank you for that, Caleb and Thomason. I really like it, but it's huge. I should, let's have a look at the specs. And I'll, I've just been looking at the images like a fanboy. 60-minute um, bezel. Uh -huh. 300 meters legibility. Got that. Uh, let's see what else. Shiny. I don't know. Carrying on through 3,800 euros, I think, for the for the uh, bronze uh, limited edition. 42 by 42. That is a, quite a monster. That is quite a monster because it's a square case. That's going to be huge on the wrist. It's got a Salita S. Okay, so it's got a SW300 movement. That's pretty cool. Pretty much top of the range in the Salita category, I believe. Uh, by Compass is one you're going to like. Marcello, we could probably go down the Bell and Ross rabbit hole if we had more time, I think. But yeah, it looks good. It does look good. Speaking of Ed White's showcase, how is that Ed White treating you? I love that watch. As you would expect, I mean, being loving those those original lugs and, and bracelets and everything. Um, it's a good dimension and wears slightly slimmer than the typical Panerai. Interesting, Thomas, and thank you. Uh, how much do you have to fork out for one of these? So here we go. Three, three for the blue, which I'm, I'd imagine is steel. That's in euros. And three, eight for bronze. Pretty interesting, all things considered. I just find it fascinating to see a dive watch as a, whoa, as a square and looking correct in a way, you know, it looks jarring, but in a good way, it looks intact. The screws to the sides of the case actually make it feel all the more built for purpose. Just looking at the dial, maybe these plots could have been bigger, these these uh, five minute marks. The quarters are okay, but maybe just upping the size of them a bit more. Yeah, it's a funky one, but I thought, what the hell, worth chatting about, worth chatting about. Next up, what do we have? Uh, this might be, ah, oh, yes. Now, what would we do without featuring a, and this, trying to get this right, it's a Hublot Big Bang Integral Tourbillon Rainbow. Now, why am I featuring this watch? Well, it's, it's almost a tradition running the show to, <laughs> to feature this thing. Let's see if we can have a look. Uh, vlog to watch. Oh, my gosh. There we go. There we go. Now we're talking about the good stuff. This has almost become tradition now on the show that I feature the Big Bang Rainbows because I think over every quarter they have had one, whether it's a chronograph, whether it's, you know, it's just part of their, their mantra at the moment. So I thought, why not? You know, we love a good rainbow. Uh, the photos are amazing. I th these look like renders. I don't know. You know, we've got we to take a bit of a breather and appreciate the complexity. I do love inline tourbillons, having the... <laughs> having the the main spring at the top and it's it's all nicely integrated and the i mean look at the work that goes into those settings 
each one. I, I think they're sapphires. I don't know. I'll keep up with the chat. Blend of Cartier Santos, Mido, Mido Ocean Star. We're talking about the um, Ballon Ross. It's a good shot. Uh, really like the date window. I think it was at the at the six or was it at the four, Thomas? If it's a Salita, they can be creative. I think it was at a four. Yeah, got to feature the Hublot. Got to understated elegance. You're right, Orange. I mean, this is the most the most subtle of all watches today. One thing we can't bash is the watchmaking. Hublot makes amazing movements, uh, but I think it's just great to keep with tradition, keep it consistent, and bring what everyone wants to see to the table. A full rainbow. Big bang, bigger bang, <laughs> Hublot and Classia, oxymoron. I think they do. I mean, the one watch that keeps blowing my mind is that LaFerrari partnership piece that they made. That was an amazing piece of watchmaking. Actually, we were talking at one stage, I think it was on another live stream about um, car and watch partnerships and how they never work. I think Hublot probably has had one of the best car and watch partnerships to date with that Ferrari, LaFerrari model was so good such a cool machine yeah so let's uh let's keep bashing the rainbow i guess uh, i must have my wrist inset with rainbow jewels right right i have a 7.5 inch wrist but for me only a 35.9 se uh, squares seem appropriate mm. in victor territory roar of the tiger says i mean yeah it's all it's all down to personal preference i think at the end of the day i have like a seven inch wrist on a good day and for me i think anything from 41 to 36 works perfectly. Anything bigger can be a bit too much. Anyway, this was just a bit of a, a silent segue in and around. Oh, it's just so much. Hold on a second. I remember, if I can zoom into this, will that me? I remember the last watch we covered had fully uh, embossed jewels on the cloth. I think it was actually a tang buckle that they used on that one. I'm quite unimpressed they didn't put some put some rainbow into that. 400 so 484 stones nearly 36 carats in weight oh that's a pretty decent msrp i hope you're not drinking your coffee when you read that to be on rainbows available now actually it might be a good time to talk about rainbows in general because we we often discuss models like the daytona rainbow and many other pieces the the leopard the rolex leopard people go nuts for, for the pearl master say rolex pearl master they go nuts for those in set pieces so what happens here who collects rainbow Hublot watches today? <laughs> I think it's the Big Bang response to Jean-Claude Ziva. <laughs> and yeah, that's pretty much, you're right? So his DNA now with the Rainbow Daytona admiration since he bought one. I like that, Thomason. Thank you. Um, La Venture Marine 2 should get a mention. He's, oh, geez. A very standard class, right? I was Actually, let's go back down to it because I didn't have a proper look at it, but this looks like a generic. That is quite poor. That looks like a generic clasp that's just been machined out. And that's gold, by the way. AU750, so it's all white gold. Boy, yeah. Just just too much to take in, but I thought, you know what? It's a good way to just have a bit of a... <laughs> okay, let's move on to another piece. Uh, rainbows, love them or hate them. They are here to stay. But it's factory, Clam Walker, and that's all that matters. It's factory. Right, why did I look at these Zodiac Seawolf GMTs? I find these to be quite interesting propositions, if I can find it. World, no, it's not a GMT, it's a world time, technically. I need to get back to that classic. Hold on, let's chat about that for a sec. Um, what am I doing here? Looking at images. A blog to watch covered it. Awesome shots. I'm trying to remember. Hold on. I'm trying to remember what made this watch sing to me. But before we do that, let's look at the classic. Should I leave the, the Zodiacs on the screen while we discuss it? Now, if I remember right, this watch was supposed to be in white gold or platinum. I haven't seen it in rose gold before. But what made this watch special, I think it was mentioned in the chat. It was recommended to talk about that I completely forgot. This watch celebrates a, what, 300-year anniversary of the Tourbillon invention, uh, extra platinum anniversary. I wonder why it's in... Um, in rose gold i would imagine i think the movement is all platinum if i remember right so it's a limited edition i'm sure most of you know and there's lots of debate actually just bear in mind we're talking about the watch on the right not the not the zodiac <laughs> but there's been debate about who invented the tourbillon and i think a lot of us side with it being a english watchmaker who came up with the tourbillon idea before breguet did even though it's like here and there because you know there's a few difference few years difference between the two 
but this one celebrates the huge anniversary. And I think what they've nailed here is that that offsetting, that asymmetry. It looks so correct to Breguet's approach. I mean, just look at it. You have the typical finishing on the outside, but it's, you know, it looks centered, but it's off-centered. And what makes it really special is that moving at the back, which I'll get to. Oh, it's just so good. Just so, so good. So it's all engraved. And what I really liked about this that I forgot. Oh, hold on. I clicked on this full screen. What I really liked about this is that this is a side angle projection tech drawing of the tourbillon from underneath. So we see here, this is where the pin would make contact with one of the sides. And he has the other end with the gears at the bottom. I don't know if you can see that if you squint your eyes. But this is the main tourbillon component, this horizontal. And they've got some cross hatching there. I think the industrial designers and us will enjoy this if Marcello's in the chat, if Curtis is still here. I love how they've done it. They've, they've labeled it A, B, C, D. So this is the original sketch that they've engraved onto the movement, which is fantastic. And of course, 1801 to 2021. What is that? Is that 200 years? Wow. I'm pretty bad with my numbers. Breguet, you know, typical hallmarks that you would expect and everything. Just remember, we're talking about the watch on the right and not the left. Can I go back and leave this? I can't. Uh, back arrow. What will this do? Uh huh. So there's the original tech drawing, I believe. I believe that's the original sketch. How great is that? It's just so, so good. Of course, these are super pricey. It's a very simple watch. I mean, all things considered, it's a tourbillon. It's all platinum. The movement's all platinum, which I don't believe has ever been done before. The, the actual, I mean, look at the rotor. I don't know if you know this, but the rotor is like semi-skeletonized and it runs around this outer gear, which is incredible. It's just, it's reggae. I mean, what else can you say? That tech drawing just makes it look so good. Yeah, it's it's well worth sharing as an anniversary piece. Engineering, all of that there. It's really good. And price-wise, I don't even know if it's relevant. I don't even think they mentioned it here. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, 28800 quite a high beat rate for a watch that, you know, doesn't have anything going on apart from a tourbillon. Anyway, uh, spectacular. I, what I find just so endearing is that, that asymmetry and how it's been put off set, but still looks centered and balanced and is so true to Breguet's design language and what they do. Hmm. Exposed brick vibe. I like that. Um, love the yellowy background of that text sketch. I don't know what that's about. If that was the paper that they used or if that's just the age of the paper. I'd imagine extracts from the patent granted to Breguet by a French interior minister. This is just the age of the paper, I'm sure. So good. I mean, oh, we're getting really designerly in the show. Okay, so we've chatted about Breguet enough. Oh, Megan's mentioning 133 euro. That is quite a, that's quite a price quite a price let's jump to something a bit more down to earth and world times have i got two of these open i do zodiac gmt there was mention in the chat about do they call it a peripheral i like that justin a peripheral rotor i did not know that was the name that is really nice yeah it's good it's beautiful it's just just absolute standout okay so like catching up in the chat that i missed there was a mention about zodiac have designs appear like inexpensive glycines I think they're on par in a way. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think they belong to the citizen group. I, when it comes to acquisitions, I don't know the names that hold ties to these pieces, but they have definitely come out swinging. And I mean, you know, the typical Seawolf design. I actually have two. There's one that they did for Topper Jewelers uh, a couple of months back that really does look amazing. These are a bit more of your generic looking Seawolfs that we see pretty often. You know, a typical case. This looks, I've actually handled a GMT from the 50s, a Bakelite bezel and everything. It was amazing. It looked exactly the same as this. It was a Pepsi bezel and everything. It wasn't a world time, but, it's, you know, the, the design, the style is just a fossil. That's it, Samurai. Thank you. It's one of those. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> fossil owns Zodiac. And yeah, they brought it back to life. People are loving them because of the value proposition, because they're watches we can afford, we can experience. I'll have a look at the specs behind the movements and all of that too. Question, I've noticed this quite a lot lately that um, we're seeing lots of red bezel, white dials, red and white contrasting watches today. Is this a fashion that's coming back into form? It's like the Tokyo edition watches we see have had that similar styling too. I like it. It doesn't go too far ahead of the brief. You know, it looks pretty typical to your standard Seawolf. Only difference is now it's a GMT with that 
will timing bezel. Uh, would it even work? That's the question to ask. Uh, and hitting, what should I have? Water, I think. Need to flush the brain out. Like the traditional chatting again about the Breguet. Just so on point. <clears throat> the design, I think what also makes it so good is that it's just an unoffensive design all the way through. There's nothing that stands out to you that says this is anything other than a Breguet. The end result is that it looks almost plain, and I think that's what they were going for. It's a celebratory anniversary watch, but at the end of the day, it's nothing too special to those who don't know what makes it unique. Turn it around and say, well, it's a full platinum movement, and it's just a work of art. Then it gets attention. Okay. Those Bakelite bezels, too great. I, no, I believe they are acrylic. I don't think any manufacturer makes Bakelite bezels today. Someone correct me there. Bakelite is a pain in the naught to process. It's an expensive material to make, and it's it's not as anywhere near as efficient as so many other materials. I'd be interested in knowing if they actually loomed the names on the bezel. That would be amazing. Um, so F1 PT says Breguet lugs are terrible. Just a couple of matchsticks. Yeah, yeah, right. Just a couple of matchsticks. They should look jaune for how they do lugs. I guess with them, they they're keeping too traditional pocket watch styling they aren't going it's same as um <clears throat> as longer in a way everything is straight nothing too organic and you know, that's how they used to make the original watches just welding on some gold onto the lugs nothing nothing to stand out they built the case first and then they chuck the lugs on later it's an amazing process by the way i love i don't know if you've ever seen the, the manufacturing process of breguet and makers like roger smith um how they go through those stages of of building the case up and then welding the lugs together. <laughs> I take you're not a Breguet fan. <laughs> uh, what will the 22 dial color? Oh, exactly, Samurai. Right? I think green. Green seems to be a big one. Burgundy. We're going to have a look at a burgundy watch later on too. The burgundy Moser that came out was amazing. Um, yeah. Sorry that I'm missing you again in the chat, ladies and gents. Uh, lugs and service prices both suck. Worse than industry. And that's, I think, where a lot of uh, people buy Breguet because they, they they do tank on the secondhand market, let's be real. Um, I think the one Breguet that we should all look at is those, those traditional models, traditional pieces. Those are so good. Open work, small dial at the 12, and then you have your mainspring, everything on display. The downside are the service costs, and I think that's what makes them so attainable on the, on the secondhand market is because people just don't want to pay those service costs for them. I don't know if they've fixed that over time, but that's always been a main complaint about Breguet watches, right? The servicing is nuts. What about purple? Oh, man. Yeah, it's, I think one at a time, one color at a time. It's an interesting thing just discussing how, how dials change and how the colors are being, oh, this is quite cool. I, I really like the silver and red contrast. It does look nice. I mean, it's striking. Not not for an everyday watch, but it is striking. Oh, geez. Orange just launched a new... See, there's a thing I can't keep up. Remember, this is supposed to be end of October. Moving across to November, we'll be doing that at the uh, fourth quarter of the year segment. Or maybe just a recap. I don't know. I don't know. So it's a good-looking piece. Nothing that stands out too much, but I thought worth sharing just because... You don't very often see a world time and a Zodiac put in the same sentence. What else did I find? Uh, yeah, this is a nice one. This one was worth looking at. I think I might have saved it. Uh, Tag Heuer Night Diver Aquaracer. What makes this watch great? And I really hope they have an article of it for us. Of course, Hodinky does. Uh, GQ. Will GQ be allowed? Oh, here we go. This is just classic, I believe, 80s, 80s flair. We really are sticking to the dive watches today. So we saw this watch featured in, in James Bond, I think. Um, who was it? Uh, it was, uh, hold on, it's Timothy Dalton. Didn't he wear one of these during his, his time as Bond? Night, Night Diver, I think, is such a nice concept. This being, I think, PVD. Let me try and catch up. I'll read it quickly. Um, 1979. Watchmakers were struggling against the unstoppable advance of courts. Uh, Jack Hoyer moved to produce an underwater watch reference 844 that grew into the professional 1000 series. I think virtually every, it was, it was Dalton. Thanks, Caleb. I think almost everyone here knows the professional 1000 series because so many of, of us in the community got into watches because of Tag Hoyer. Funny, I'll actually, since we're on the topic, I'm going to pull up what, what really 
actually grabbed me into this hobby in the first place. It was the Jack Hoyer uh, Carrera, I think. Yeah, this this one, funny enough, uh, if I can get a fully imaged picture somehow, I think it was the gray dial. I remember seeing this watch and thought, that is so cool. That is so cool. This is one of the first watches. Sorry about the pixelations. You get you get the you get the concept, but the Carrera and this style. I, I like the Jack Hoyer partnership and everything there. I, I had no idea about watches, by the way. This must have been 20, 2013, 2014. I just kept on going back to look at this piece. It's got the red stitching underneath the strap. It's got a proper rally style strap, which is nice. The Carrera is just such a classic. It's got that, and being the anniversary piece. Yeah, this was, funny enough, this was the watch that got me very interested in pulling the trigger on a watch in the first place. I love it. I think the Carrera is just one of those. So good. Anyway, a bit of a strange tangent there. But similar to a lot of us who got into these into the hobby because of Tag Heuer, they have decided to reinvigorate the Aqua Racer Night Diver. And I love the novelty of it. A fully loomed dial is so nice. I'm not so much of a fan of the standard Aqua Racer that they've just brought out. It's it's cool. It's okay. But it's not like really like X-Factor stuff, X-Factor material, you know? The idea of a fully loomed dial and all black components and I don't know, they could have, I would have given the option fully loomed out the, the plots everywhere. Maybe having a blue loom instead of green. So you have a bit of a backdrop. Yeah, but but Tag Heuer has, I think, been quite instrumental for a lot of us here. Um, Formula One drew me into the hobby, right? That's exactly it, Samra. I think Tag was a gateway drug for many, for sure, Rick. I, I agree. I think so many of us, I mean, me included, hooked on on Tag in the first place. Um, and sorry that I'm missing you again in the chat. You guys have been chatting. Timothy Dalton. I really like this tag. It's good, right? It's really good. Uh, the way they've done the, the Cyclops at the base of the dial, I think I actually pulled this. I've, I've cut this out, so it's a bit nicer to see. The Cyclops at the base of the dial is pretty good. Um, the cream color. I also like how it plays in the light, how in some photos it's it's white. I mean, that looks good. See, they did have the idea. They had contrasting loom for the minute hand. I would have had the contrasting loom all the way around the dial. So you had the, the green and blue as a contrast. I guess the criticism could be it has an octagonal square-ish bezel, but that's very true to the Aqua Racer name and their design. Um, orange loom. Oh, Sam Ray nailed it. Orange loom on this watch. Just everywhere. Like orange loom on the numerals, on the hands, the bezel pip. Yeah. Even on the crown, maybe. Excellent. Really interesting value prop. We chatted about the um, that, that GP Titanium a second ago. <clears throat> Similar kind of category where you have... This experimental diver, this actually having some history and quite a nice bit of heritage to it. We're looking at Tag Heuer. I mean, how cool is that? Hitting the water again. I'm actually starting to lose my voice. Still runs flawlessly without service. Here we go. Um, this is from AAZ. 15-year-old Acro Racer still runs flawlessly. 12-sided. <laughs> Mason, thank you. 12-sided bezel. Uh, I can't count on the fly, clearly. Um, also just love, I mean, the way the lugs have been done and the edges are all nicely finished, great edges. Yeah, 15 years, no service, still running like a charm. So a lot of people bash Tag Heuer because of the name, because it's it's not traditional Heuer anymore. But, I mean, you know, you're getting a great wash here. I love the design of this. I, I'm always, I think I've said this so many times before on the page. Uh, oh, there we go. Look at that. That's what it looks like in some lights, I think. I think they had two models, one with a standard white dial and one with a loom dial. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Nope, nope, that's it. Oh, it looks so good. What was I saying? I was on a tangent. Um, I don't know, whatever. Probably wasn't important. It's great, just so well done. Oh, um, being such a fan of watches and how they originated and their history, I love it when a watch is brought back from the you know, brought back from the past and given a, a fresh skin, uh, and this is just another one of those pieces that has definitely been, you know, received well. I think. Al twenty nine. So many more of you that I'm missing in the chat. Sorry about that, everyone. We're running the show for an hour and a half. Doing pretty good. Um, we've chatted through only eleven watches. This is bad. Bad news. Apparently, Tagway made a thirty six. I wouldn't be surprised. A thirty six mil Aqua Racer for ladies. I wouldn't be surprised. They are, I think, experimenting with mid-sized pieces quite a bit. 
And I see Russell's just joined us. You'd like this watch, Russell. Um, this is calling back to the 1980s, a fully loomed diver. I haven't even checked if it's titanium or if it's PVD or DLC or let's see. Look how good that is. You just want this watch for the loom shot. Like nothing else matters. This is great. Let's see if I can find, I'll look at the specs at the bottom. It's even got a deploy and clasp. I mean, that's great stuff. That really is great stuff. A little bit of value for money you're getting here. Uh, same price between 3K and 3.5K. They're talking about competitors like Oris, Tudor offer in-house movements. Oh, uh -huh. That's interesting. So this uses a Salita SW200. They're asking between 3 and 3.5. Watches and their prices. At the end of the day, that's what seals the deal, huh? You know, Beaver's still running tag. I don't know. I'll, maybe someone can mention in the chat if, if Jean-Claude Beaver's still running tag Hoyer. But the great Ulysses Nodan Diver, that is a goodie. I, did that come out? The, was there a model? Oh, there was. No? A skeleton diver of some kind? Maybe you can have a look at that later. Samurai saying it's a caliber 5 ETA. Oh, ETA base. Is this it? Why are they saying Salita here? Um, caliber 5 is based on the Salita. Okay, got it. Got it. Very interesting. Yeah, it's just a great package. I love, I just love the design. I think the strap's been nicely implemented there. It's it's good to see the Aqua Racer back on form. And this is the USP that you want for a watch like this, don't you think? Um, it's one way to really grab people's attention by saying we're bringing back an 80s classic with this novelty of a fully loomed dial and it just looks so stealth. Uh, you have that white dial finish, but then you've got this contrast and ah, beautiful. Okay, moving on next to, what did I save? Okay, Longines, this is a titanium titanium spirit, I think they call it. This one's a bit of a head scratcher, and I thought we were worth, is everyone going crazy about the, okay, let's follow what Time and Tide has to say. Why is everyone going crazy about the Longines titanium spirit? Do they have any real images or just renders? No real images. I'm going to find some. Hold on a sec. Now, we have noticed very recently, I'm going to open up the monochrome. <clears throat> We've noticed very recently that brands are starting to jump on this titanium train fast. Rolex looks like, Tudor has always been, but I mean, manufacturers are looking at titanium as the alternative metal. Grand Seiko, good shout that was mentioned that Grand Seiko um, often uses titanium and they polish it up nicely. Chatted about it quite often, about it being an excellent material, lightweight and all that stuff. The Spirit is one of those pieces that on the on the outside you could say is the the idyllic form of a watch that you would want to see don't you think um the dial aesthetics it's just again non, non offensive in any way it's so clean there's no date there's nothing that that looks out of place except the five stars which i've never understood it's like it's so <laughs> it's so heavy handed to have that on your dial and I think it detracts from the Longines logo in many ways. It just it stands out a bit too much. Overall, though, the aesthetic is great. It has your typical field watch motifs and elements. Uh, let's catch the chat. Sorry, Salita ETA movements, in my experience, at least. Salita is the ETA successor. Thomason, thank you for that. I was all saying looks like a much more elevated Orient TriStar. <laughs> That's one thing, hey? one way of saying it. Yeah, so they brought it out on bracelets and on... Uh, it just looks like a nylon strap. I think the actual color of the watch and the way the polishing works is very nice. We've seen titanium used now with the big eye and many other pieces that they're offering. So yeah, chronometer rate. I guess it has chronometer certified specifications. Maybe we can have a look at that in a sec. Uh, but it's just an interesting piece. to talk about lug length being too long. I want to ch chat about that in a sec. But it just looks no nonsense apart from the five stars. No nonsense and the five stars for awards they won years ago. I, I always thought that that was a part of it. I always used to call this watch the flagship <clears throat> because I believed it was something to do with its uh, heritage, similar to the uh, Omega Globemaster and the Constellation, always having the star to represent its its chronometer certification and that it's been um, the Meteorology Institute basically certified it to be an excellent chronometer for its application. I thought that had to do with the process, but maybe it's just a gimmick. I don't know. I'll have to have a look at the, the reading. Represents that as a chronometer. Okay, Eric. So it's so it's the same then as as Omega. I like it. Okay. I think it's a bit too much, <laughs> personally. I think one star would be good enough. Five stars. Uh, the one thing, the one comment this watch always gets when I show it to people is, 
why does it have five stars? Why so much down here? Because it almost, you know, you know what I would do in a situation like this. I would take the automatic, probably put it at the base, maybe even remove the automatic completely. Chronometer is nice. It's it's good to have that little little bash of saying, yes, this is chronometer certified. So it's it's a much more accurate piece. I just love the aesthetics though. The diamond elements at the at the batons, uh, it's actually got some stepping to it. There's depth to the dial. The, the pencil hands are perfect. Just so good. Why don't more brands do this with their pencil hands and finish them off? So many just cut them off as rectangles and don't don't leave any space. I mean, it looks so good. Very nicely done. So it's not it's by no means exciting. I mean, this watch has been around a while. The, the big difference is the titanium case and bracelet. Uh, the recycled Longines mark of excellence. Thanks for that, Pedro. Small seconds mirroring the chapter ring instead of the stars. I'm trying to read that again. The small seconds mirroring the chapter ring instead of the stars. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, hold on. So we're talking about how the, the little pip on the seconds hand is mirroring the components. Yeah, on the chapter ring instead of the stars. Hmm. Yeah, because that it's, yeah, it's, it's like there's almost too many shapes going on. If you squint your eyes on the left here and see that the stars have this jaggedness where the, you know, the diamonds look a little bit less in your face. Maybe that's something that gets in our way and we find it a bit perplexing as a, as a combo. Still, um, really interesting looking piece. I th oh, it's got a gloss dial too. That's great. Technically a gilt dial, which is also nice. Yeah, and I think Longines is starting to fall into the community. Many are starting to look at the watches with a bit more respect. The Heritage Collection, I think, is one of the most, I mean, Longines has one of the best catalogs of past designs to pull from. And we're just seeing it time and time again, Heritage Military, Heritage Marine National, Heritage Classic. It just did one in partnership with Hodinkee. A little bit, yeah. Also chronometer rated, so I'm guessing they're using the same movement in that watch. Uh, but this is this is kind of like that old school with a touch of modern. I think that's the direction that they were trying to go with this piece. Good looking example. And I don't know if I can any more, not many more interesting pictures to look at, but we get to just, I could go back and have a look at some of the specs for us. Talking about sizes, 100 meter water resistance, excellent for diving. Uh, interchangeable system, that's something important to note. The strap, this bracelet can move pretty easily. I think you just push the buttons. I'm surprised a lot more brands aren't following the Cartier Santos train, doing similar interchangeable straps and bracelets. I think that's one thing they really pioneered. So it's it's an ETA kind of caliber, right? ETA-esque caliber, COSC certified, 72-hour power reserve, and between 2.5 on the strap and 2.9 euro on the bracelet. Not bad. <clears throat> Not bad. I wouldn't say it's for everyone. It is kind of simple, kind of too simple. And carrying on the chat. Sorry, I'm missing you here. Let's see. So uh, Thomas says, yep, their stars represent five-star chronometer level. The price tag to match another similar model with stars without the stars, low price point. Got it. Got it. Need a space. Mr. GMT, welcome to the show. Yeah, it's a goodie. Longines should remake the 30 hertz movement. I think they've got so much still to do, which, yeah, I'm actually looking at Longines because of the potential they offer in many ways. Uh, the way they are addressing the heritage collection, the CEO has said that they're not stopping anytime soon with how they're working them. I think it's there's more power to them. Keep it going. If you have Instagram, follow Vintage Longines. He, I think he's based in Cambridge. He's based in the UK. Hitting the water. He has such a good collection, such a good knowledge. He, that's all he collects. Vintage Longines. Uh, he has salmon dials and beautiful sector dials. So many things you can study up about these bits and pieces. And truth is, yeah, we are not. I don't. There's no Rolex on this show. I'm afraid not this week. Um, no Rolex releases to talk about really yet. We did chat about the uh, the Yacht Master at one stage. Next up, okay, so the GP um, Laureato limited edition Sapphire Tourbillon, or I don't know what they call it. This one I really like, Absolute Light. Is that the model? No, is it? It is. I really like this thing. I really, really like this one. So limited to 88 pieces for those of you, <laughs> those of you who want to know. The skeletonized Laureato is one of my favorite skeletonized movements out there. Um, next to the Royal Oak skeleton, which we see very often, I prefer this design miles better. 
I love the arrangements. I love how these bridges, I actually refer to it a lot in, in videos and in discussions. I love how these bridges feel like everything's been considered. They've been cut in such a way that it all fits in. Uh, the way the balance is oh, so nice. There's just so many things to enjoy about it. Plus, now you're seeing it with a sapphire case, full sapphire case. I would imagine titanium ends to the to the strap. Now, on one hand, we could say it looks a bit plasticky, right? It looks a bit plastic. Uh, I don't think any of us could really deny. But I also just think it's that it's that going through with the formula of you have a skeleton and now let's make it fully see-through at the same time. <laughs> plasticky. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> what am I saying? I'll take two. They're small. Roar of the tiger. That's it. Uh, so Skizion says, what do you think of the Longines retrograde? Ah, oh, I love it. I don't know why. I'd have to look at it. It's, I could pull it up. I could try and pull it up since we were just chatting about Longines. Um, let me see if I can get the reference up. Oh my God. This is the one problem with Longines is that their references are just similar to Omega and so many others. L4797, will we get it? Huh. I haven't seen this model before. This is an oldie. Um, so that's a retrograde seconds. That's always something worth looking at. It's a chronograph. Wow. That's, that's pretty cool. I don't know how to read the thing. What do all the hands do? It's got it's got a it's got a weak component there. It's got the running seconds. This is to do with the date, and this is to do with twenty four hour time. Okay, got it. Very interesting. Yeah, this looks so like un uh, long jean traditional stuff, but reminds me in a way of of a um, JLC deep sea. What's it? The master compressor series that they did in the early two thousands. It has that kind of vibe to it, but it looks more classical. You know. Not bad. Um, this this GP is a new, just a change in design. Needs more hands, the friend says. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think that's the one thing that just I find flattering. This is much more legible, the blued hands. Uh, it's There's so many hands going on here. It's just, it's nuts. I do like the balance in a way. How do you even read the time? Look at the, it's like, yeah, mix of pusher styles. I don't know so much. Yeah, right. Rounded and then squared off. This is quite typical to Longjean. Okay, let's get off back on track. We'll be at it all day if we chat about these pieces, I tell you. Wish the crown was sapphire. Yeah, right. So this is not a new watch. I, I thought it was something that... Oh, here we go. We've got some examples of the original GPs. they got a long history. These Laureatos really went through hell and back. Um, yeah, I just like the whole, the whole layout, the assembly. I believe it was released this year, but maybe I read that wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, cool chrono. I tell you what. We could do a standard show, not on watch releases, but just in general, general watch talk and just banter for days about it because there's so much to look at. What I love so much about a show like this is that <clears throat> there's always something new released. It's amazing how much turnover there is in the watch industry. Even if it's nothing new, if they reskin it, change the color, put a new material in it, uh, it's worth looking at and discussing. And these photos are amazing. Monochrome, monochrome always does good work. Always, always, always. I love an open mainspring. You can watch it being wound and uh, I like it. See, the rancher's joined us. Welcome, the rancher. Um, I quite like the JLC Master Geographic. Same, same, but different. Yeah, yeah, the Geographic's a goodie. Um, I really had this fixation. I think it was the Master Control Diver. No, the Master Control Memovox. That one I looked at a while back. I really like that for some reason. Cool looking piece. Definitely not a watch for everyone, but the way they've gone with skeletonizing and at the same time, sapphire case and everything there. I love the finishing. Look at that rotor. Even the rotor's been evacuated. Uh, 88 limited edition. I mean, <clears throat> so many limited editions. We're not done with limited editions, by the way. Going to see a couple more of them. I like to come here and learn. <laughs> yeah, the ranch. I don't know what we're doing. It's just usual banter. Um, Got to hit the whiskey or something to keep my brain going. How long have we been running? An hour, two, an hour and 40, hour 45, I think. Yeah, not bad. Yeah, this show is, is very higgledy-piggledy, you know, just throw in whatever I found interesting over the course of a few months. Uh, this Hold on a second. Have I just missed something? Check this out. The hands are different. What is going on here? Is this the older one or the newer one? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone else notice? Nice swatch, Forbin says, right? I, I mentioned it looks kind of plasticky at one stage. What's with the hands? Why are they different? We, I think in the biz, we call these pincher hands. I think that's that James mentioned that to me at one stage. We call them pincher hands. 
Um, but we have pencils on here. I, I think this is the more traditional style of hand that they're using. Swatch jellyfish. I mean, that's a classic. What about G-Shock? G-Shock and their jellyfish style watches. I don't know what they call them today. Ghost or something. Nice looking piece. I, I really like it. Really like the presentation. Okay, next up. What do we have? Aha. Now, don't turn off your sets. Uh, code 1159. What is this called? It's the Tourbillon Two-Tone, I think. I think. Uh, watch by S okay monochrome covered it open work that's it so it's it's called the the open the names of these things Odema Piguet Tourbillon open work now two tone in gold now I'm wondering why this one has a leather strap and the other has a nylon strap I uh, don't ask questions just keep going <clears throat> the debate around the 1159 is always uh, going to be open i think we're always going to discuss this watch and how just strange it is and how it doesn't feel like like ap at all but the funny thing is they've used lots of elements that do harken back to ap in their designs so i mean like we look to the, the hands that they use this is so typical of the perpetuals that we saw that belong to classic ap lines uh, previously like the 33 mil models and all of those I, I I freaking love this arrangement though. I find this to be such. Uh, if if there was only one code eleven fifty nine, open work tourbillon, why don't they make this the mainstay? If you really want to up your sales, AP, listen in. Make the open work tourbillon one of the defining watches. Lower the price of this piece because of course it's going to be going for like four times your standard price of a normal watch. Lower your price and advertise it as one of the cheapest tourbillon watches that you can find today. They would make such a killing with this watch. Uh, I think the attention is on it for the right reasons. The two-tone metal, of course, the octagonal case is really a good callback to the to the AP styling, the Royal Oak styling. This one having the two bridges, I don't know why these are different colors, but we'll get through it eventually. Yeah, of course, these are limited editions, so uh, they have different examples there. The hands are so illeg are, yeah, not not legible. Illegibility is a problem with this piece, but with a movement like that. Are you buying a watch like this to tell time? I mean, in general, are you buying a skeleton watch to tell time? That's the point. I mean, the legibility of a skeleton watch on most days is nah, debatable. Uh, I just I find it to be quirky enough that it doesn't look like your traditional AP and feels more future focused, which the Code Eleven Fifty Nine was supposed to be. That was like a part of the mantra. <clears throat> maybe they i think they should have fixed the hands they could have just gone typical genta hands that they use on on the nautilus and the royal oak in general but i i do admire how in a way that the case has all these evacuated components and you know the edging and the smoothness and the brushed elements how that then translates to the dial it makes sense it feels like there's a there's an organic put that in quotes organic relationship between everything there's this technicality element you know yeah, so I think this watch has garnered quite a bit of appreciation. Julian's saying, I like these. The standard models, I mean, just the time only, the Hugo Boss looking examples, not for everyone. Uh, they, they are beautiful. I mean, the crystals, I don't know if you've ever seen the crystals of these in the flesh. They are just out of this world. 41 mil diameter, 10 mil height, 10.7, 18 karat white gold bezel. I would imagine this is also 18 karat rose gold uh, at the middle of the case. The reference, if you want to know, is 26600CR00D009K. It's, it's, it's extensive. 175 Swiss francs. So that's quite a lot. That is quite a lot. In a gray lacquered flange with, yeah, they're talking about all this. I don't know if this is the model that we're looking at on the left. This is the more recent one, I think, with the two-tone. Maybe these are just different examples. This one's a lot more legible, contrasting metal for the hands. Hands are way too thin. Yep. I think we can all agree on that point for sure. Again, tourbillon that's all centered nicely. We had a look at that hublot. Similar kind of style there. Looks good. Uh, Karen on. I'm going to meet you in the chat. Sorry that I'm slowing down. Slim hands is legibility not important to anyone. Yeah, small date windows. <laughs> yeah, Abdul. I think a lot of us. Uh, and Megan says, sorry, I just can't get into the Code 11 watches. Sorry, stick from all my piece. And I mean, that's the thing. Would you rather have an AP Royal Oak or would you rather have the Code 1159? And I think 99% of people will say that they'll get a Royal Oak before one of these. So 
Yeah, it's, it's difficult to know what to do to remedy a watch like this. It was bold, <laughs> put it that way. Quite adventurous for them to go so far with this this design. The perpetual calendar is amazing with these two. Aventurine dial, they did one of those. It's a mouthful of code. References too long. Yep. I mean, it falls into the, the whole brackets, you know, being a code 1115. Even the name, was it put together in the final minutes? I, I've never understood the name either. Hey, now we're talking. Right. Uh, 1815. What was this? The concourse. Oh, I'm going to get this wrong. Longer. Hope I spelled this right. Uh, the Como edition. Is that what they call it? I think it was. Yeah. GQ covered it. Monochrome. Yes. Concorso. Okay. So this is called the, <clears throat> the Salmon 1815 for the Concorso de Eleganza. Now, this is a piece unique. So you can't get your hands on one. <clears throat> and I'm losing my voice, hitting the water. This has to be one of the most beautiful 1815 chronographs we have ever seen, might ever see in our lives. <clears throat> Apparently, it's Fisherman's Friend time has to happen. The voice is uh, acting up on me. Hold on a sec. One of one. And the best, I love the monochrome article because you go to the bottom and it says price, not relevant. It's the most, it's just beautiful. Okay, so what do we have? I I don't even know if it's platinum or white gold. This is bad of me. Um, lots of talk about this being a salmon dial. Apparently, it's a rose gold dial. It's not actually salmon. They, they've got this other system they use to it. Solomon, yeah, <laughs> uh, so, a.k.a. the Fandango. Uh, piece is nice. Code 11, now worth consideration. At, at a 50% discount. Yeah, why not? So it's white gold. Thanks for that, Russell. So Concourse of Elegance, I mean, similar to the Concourse of Elegance in the UK and many other places, it's just a time to show off amazing, amazing classic cars. Oh, let's have a look at these images. Let's full screen this. It's just, this is Lake Como, right? I mean, this is the kind of stuff that films and movie sets are made of. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. Yeah, I think a couple in the chat have been and, and live on Lake Como. So props to you. Amazing setting. And then you get to the cars, 300 SLs. You have all the Ferraris. You've got beautiful, just like Triumphs and Alphas and classic Ferraris. And I don't even know what this is. They're all prototypes. The winner of this watch, by the way. So what happened is basically um, your car. Oh, look at these things. That is, that's an Abarth. I thought it was a Studebaker for a second. The winner of this event won this lunga on the left hand side of the screen and there's lots of little uh quirks that make it even more special it's got a hunter case back so many more little bits and pieces so i'll be sure to share that with you here let's just admire some cars for a second this is a classic maserati these are all like from the 50s i'd imagine <clears throat> this is like 40s i would say can't tell you all the names of these is that a bentley no, i don't know carrying on is that is that a oh that's a that's an atlantique I think that's a Bugatti Atlantique. Maybe I'm wrong. Just, I mean, we could talk about these for days. Uh, I think our man Russell knows this gent pretty well. Uh, and just appreciating the finesse that goes into, I mean, similar to watches. We love watches for their movements. The, the restoration scene and the classic car scene is huge. We talk very often about where the world is going with disposable culture and, and, um, technology and how we're getting digital with everything we do electric cars these are now seen as luxuries and i think the combustion engine car is going to be seen as a luxury too very soon uh but this is just that's a bmw the guy's sitting in i wonder what that might be a 2002 or something interesting choice of car i mean i'm wondering could be a 2002 he's sitting in with a watch like this just so good a lot of these are renders a lot of these are real 1815 chrono is amazing it's a flyback it's very simple for what it is but i love i mean the colors just is what makes it sing unfortunately it's a one of one i don't know what the winner is going to is going to do with a watch like this and carrying on in the chat sorry let's see again let's see 275 knot i probably missed that uh, one of the cars royal oak unless i can get a code 1159 for less than 2k <laughs> uh for next time coffee is better for a dry throat than water decaf if necessary thank you for that skizzy on that's your name, Skizion. Cool name. Look at this. I mean, oh, who doesn't like a Hunter case back? They've even given you a little tab to pull. So this is celebrating the event. It's got a full-on crest. It's just so much to take in. I love it. Oh, it's so good. Can you imagine the honor of being able to win this event and get this watch just as a 
as a throw in. So the question is knowing what the guy's going to do with it. Is he going to send it to a museum? Is he going to donate the watch? Is he going to keep it in a case? Is he ever going to wear it? Of course, they don't show you the winning car, but I think it was a Ferrari 250 or one of those. Just so beautiful. We can have a look at the specs of this quickly. I think most of us know the 1815 pretty well. Only difference is that it has this piece unique dial. Uh, only 50 cars selected and categorized. Car enthusiast show. Yeah, yeah. Carrying on through. Technically speaking, we're looking at the same case here. Yeah, I mean, it's all the same. Nothing much change apart from the dial and that beautiful back. Just stunning. So the reason why I threw this in was because it's one of the most notable longer releases of the year, for sure. And later on, we're going to have a look at the Zeitwerk Phantom in Honey Gold, which was a part of the cover. I love this price. Not relevant. It's one of the best things you can ever have on a listing. Not relevant. Availability gifted to the winner. Um, <clears throat> dark brown strap, 18 karat white gold, pronged buckle. Yeah. Rhodium steel subsidiary hands, blah, blah. It's just so good, man. So, so good. And, and the setting is also, oh, what an amazing just an amazing machine. I'll get to the movement again and address the chat and then we can move on to the next piece. I don't know how we're doing for time. I think we've just passed the halfway mark. That ain't good. Imagine if advanced cats went to the luxury collar show. Outsiders would be phased. Imagine if advanced cats went to a luxury collar show. The second I saw advanced cats, I thought you meant cat back exhaust. We're talking about cars. Uh, a luxury collar show for cats. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm reading. And then there's talk about, oh, the, the Benedict Cumberbatch Polaris Mariner. <clears throat> Just remember, I, I like to focus on the best watches and quotations for all different categories. The Polaris hasn't really been one that's, that's um, grabbed me very much, actually. Uh, it's had lots of complaints, in fact. We can have a look at it. We definitely can have a look at it. Zenith over 11.59. Oh, for sure. <laughs> no, meow, meow, cats. <laughs> Uh, cat back exhausts. I don't know what I'm thinking. Okay, let's move on through. Such a cool watch. Oh, yeah, now the next one. We are getting a little bit up in the price categories. Let's see if I can get this name right. I don't even know if I nailed it properly. Let's see. Um, it is the JLC Reverso Tribute Minute Repeater, right? Now, we did cover, and I think it might have been Q2 of this year. Does Monochrome cover this watch? I hope they do. Revolution, SJX. There's some great options. Let's have a look at SJX. Maybe they have some good stuff. Maybe, maybe. Any any real images or just renders? I think they've only shared renders of this piece. Okay, so we had a chat about the most complicated reverso ever done, being their 90th tribute that they did, the 90th anniversary. And that watch had everything. I mean, I can't even remember all the complications. It has like full planetary rotations and all of that stuff. This is the tamer version. It's just a skeleton minute repeater, you know, nothing much to brag about. Uh, but I thought well worth looking at because it's a reverso and the way they do their reverso is to have the, yeah, I'm using this render as the, as the image. The way they do reversos and play around with the skeletonizing and how everything works, rotates, is manipulated around. Very intricate and complicated. Yeah, that's, I would agree, Abdul. That's, that's a love it or hate it thing. The problem is it's not very legible. Do you want, it's like <clears throat> similar to this, that fancy anniversary watch they brought out. <clears throat> Do you want the minute repeater on display? I would say you would. You would want to see everything working. It's a manual, I'm sure it's a manual wind, so you get to appreciate all the componentry of the movement of the back and the front. I don't even know how many, if it's two time zones, it's probably two movements in one, right? I mean, JLC, they just keep on nailing it. What do you prefer? Do you prefer a more open three-dimensional city or do you prefer the, the vertical uh, polishing of the back? It's amazing. I mean, minute repeaters are nothing to scoff at. And I, I say time and time again, the way that JLC with their reversos, they don't compromise on the reverso aesthetic. They fit the movement into the watch. They don't fit the watch around the movement. They are that advanced as watchmakers that they will make it fit. It's like, any good mechanic, you know, it will fit. You just use a hammer and a couple of screws, you'll get it done. But at least it's a minute repeater. So legibility is replacing the tone of telling time, Abdul perfectly said. And I mean, that's the whole point of the minute repeater, right? Originally just done because you couldn't see the, the watch face <laughs> in your mansion where you have no, uh, no lights on in the house. You have candles and it's much easier to hear the time than to actually read the time. 
I wonder if any purist still plays polo in these. Imagine playing polo in one of these. I mean, that's like, that's a risk. I don't know any, we can have a look at the, the release and the limited edition component and stuff. I'm sure they've only made a few open dial. It's just so beautiful. You just cannot critique JLC. The reverso is just, is there a reverso they do badly? Is there ever a reverse? I mean, when you get a reverso, you have done so well. I think that's what I said. I made a video like three years back. It basically said that if you get a reverso, whether it's the classic standard time only, you move all the way up to this category of tourbillons and minute repeaters and skeleton dials, it's, an, it's a success because there's no feeling like you're missing out on something when you get the watch, you know? It just it caps, it captures... Oh, it's so good, man. It's so, so good. So it looks like that they've... They've got two crystals, crystal at the top and one underneath, and it's like a skeleton floating floating arrangement for the batons. Ooh, it's good. Bear in mind that these are actually circular movements. They mount onto a square chassis, which is pretty interesting. JLC know that life through microscope is a different universe, right? I wonder if those scales are more stunning and possibly more legible. In real Maybe. We're talking about you know lighting and how light works. I think... To improve, I mean, to improve the legibility of a watch in general, making the hands brushed would probably add a bit of difference. If these hands were not polished but brushed instead, I know they're Dauphine, so they're split down the middle. You can see the light play. <clears throat> if they were brushed, something tells me that it would be even easier to read at offset angles. That's just beautiful. It's so complex. It's real artwork. And I know this is definitely not one for us to all appreciate. It's, would you call it, you couldn't call it the purest reverso in any, in any way. This is the one who wants to go down the route of really appreciating what the minute repeater represents. Best Richard Mille skeleton alternative. Yeah, right. This or Richard Mille. Which would you go for? I like that. I can think of so many other minute repeaters I'd prefer to have on the wrist. There are. I mean, what, what do we have? APs. Uh, where do you even stop? I think we're going to have a look at Patek minute repeaters later on. I can't remember, but... Yeah, I uh, once the one thing I love, I think I've said this so many times, I'll repeat it again, is that JLC doesn't compromise on their cases in order to fit the movement in it. They work around that formula. So special to see. Are we going to see both Rolex and Tudor Coke GMTs in 2022? Mo and Les. Oh, that's interesting, huh? There's been chatting about that. You know, the um, the Black Bay 58 GMT is due. I think that's going to happen, I believe. JLC price. Yes, let's get to that, Julian. Sorry about that. Um 51 mil case diameter, height, pink gold, oh, 250, excluding taxes. It's good to know. One of 10 pieces out there. So so there we go. 35 hour power reserve. Huh. 26 beats per hour. That's pretty good. They've lowered the beat rate. Can you imagine if it was a 2800? I think it would probably be like a, a less than a 30 hour power reserve on the piece. Yeah, so there's been lots of talk about um, Black Bay 58 GMT being a possibility. I like that. Uh, as far as Rolex with the Titanium Yacht Master, I, I actually chatted about it before as the show began. Yes, I think that's very possible, as well as the Tudor Snowflake. And I just had another Deja Vu. Two Deja Vus in one show. It's so strange. <laughs> 250K beta. <laughs> bargain, right? Right, it is. It sure is a bargain. Play polo with that any day of the week. What do we have up next? Uh, I don't remember. Let's see. Uh, let's see. No, oh, okay. Okay. Are we going to chat about the chronoscope again? I made a video about the chronoscope. It wasn't seen by many people. I'll I'll link it in the corner of the screen. Let's see if GQ has any... What the... What kind of... What have they done here? I don't know so much about that presentation. Iconic watch gets a revamp. Let's get some live images. I can't... These renders... You can only take so many renders in your life, you know? Uh, yeah, let's chat about this this funky machine. I wouldn't say this is one of the best watch releases of 2022. Um, I'm interested in knowing your thoughts. I don't think we've actually chatted about this watch live at all. Shall we comment Y for yes and N for no? <laughs> um, one thing I like is this arrangement. I do think the the, the Panda style is pretty good. But... <clears throat> head scratching, head scratching to say the least. I'll be sure to link the video in the corner of the screen if you'd like to watch it, but I do a redesign and I take the first Omega in space case. I put it on a beads of rice bracelet. I make the dial fit the watch a lot more. 
I just find the dial and the case are so just contrasty. It's not that not many watches to love this quarter. You're right. You're right. That's one thing that stood out to me is that you're seeing reskins. You're not seeing anything new that stands out very heavily. So Rob's just joining. Welcome, Rob. Uh, we are going and chatting about what, <laughs> the res is horrendous. Blue is okay. Freddie Turner says, no, busy dial. No, yep, yep. Chronoscope too busy. The watch is horrendous. Dog's dinner of a watch. Oh, my goodness. I love it. Quarter of a million. Yeah, we're not talking about the reverse anymore. I think it's, I wouldn't say a near una unanimous no, but it's definitely not one that's settled with a lot of people. I wonder, Monochrome did it. <clears throat> Sorry that I'm clearing my throat. I, uh, I'm struggling here. A bit more water. Monochrome did an article on it. We can have a good look at some images up close. Yeah. So Omega has the, the watches they made in the 40s were so beautiful. Like if you watch that that quick clip that I did on the watches, the the chronograph 33.3, and there were so many references that were attached to it. The 28, I think the 298 or something. No, it wasn't something, something like that. Watches in the 40s, they all had this type of dial with the pulsations and the, the telemeter scales. Some excellent feedback on this watch. Things like get rid of the tachymeter scale, put the telemeter on the outside, make it maybe a smooth smooth bezel instead, you know, all of those things. Navi timer on steroids, I mean, that's something. Yeah, I, I believe what they did, I mean, my, my rationale is that they introduced this watch with this case because it's a new one. It's a 43 mil case. It's now got a micro adjust clasp on the bracelet, which is something very nice. I'm actually really looking forward to hearing how that goes and if people like it. Can I get this full screen? But that dial is, yeah. I mean, it's enough to really make your brain hurt. Hey? We zoom all of this in. Just look at that. Look at what's going on. It's like looking at stock trading right now. <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> okay, let's get back to the chat. It's a lost art. It is. I think dial designs in general are a lost art. It's it's nice to see that they're bringing they're trying to bring this back. I just don't think they did it that effectively with this case and this design. Less is more, Nicholas says. In a way, I, I like that it has the Swiss Army knife effect, in a sense that you're getting everything with a chronograph, you're getting the pulsations and the telemeter and just such useless features, but they also what called back to that that era. But then again, so the reason why they debuted this watch with this case is because of the new size and the, the clasp. If I can get, I don't know if they shared anything. Ooh, that's good. I mean, that looks good. That really looks good. For all the, for all the criticism we give the watch, um, I mean, this looks so true to that. What's the model? CK299, CK2998. The first Omega in space. Panda dial models, I think. Yeah. Thomas just Thomas has mentioned in the chat that original styling, the straight lugs. If they did that with this watch, I think they would, it would be received better. But on a leather strap, this does sing. This is actually, yeah, it is a leather strap. It does sing very nicely. Good contrast. And I, th I think the one downside, we were chat I think we're chatting about it in the comments of that video, is that um, the one downside to having it on a bracelet is there's just so much complexity going on when you look at the bracelet relative to the dial and what makes the dial sing is the fact that it's getting the full attention. <clears throat> Give it the full attention by eliminating anything that distracts your eye away from it. And all of a sudden you have something that's really beautiful. So yeah, it's, it's a hit. It's a miss. We don't know. We can't really movements. Nice. And I remember making this critique in the video saying that the movement should have been more decorated. I did not know it was a uh, vertical clutch column wheel. Uh, which means that it's generally not that decorated in any case. Um, so they did pull a bit of pocket watch styling around it. Nice case and bracelet doesn't need an open case back, which is wasted on the movement. Yeah, yeah. Being being a vertical clutch, generally they're not pretty at all, but that's just the way it is. Speedmaster case was the wrong choice. It's, unfortunately, was. It's also good. I, I say this a lot about Omega. It's good to see that they're trying. They are experimenting with these funky ideas that, other manufacturers aren't. They're not taking the safe route, in quotes. And then again, yeah, we don't know. No, it looks like the watch that ate, that ate the Speedmaster. Yeah. This watch would have looked better with an internal tacky scale. Yeah, I mean, get rid of the bezel altogether, I think, would make a difference. And then, yeah, just clean it up a bit more. I love the intricacy. That's one. I think that's the one thing that's 
dividing me on the watch. I do love the intricacy of all these elements inside. The technicality. Not that you would be able to read any of it, but yeah. Oh, and I see Jim Little saying, did I miss the coverage? You have not missed the coverage of the overseas. We're going to cover that right now. This I'm really impressed with, though. That is so good. This I'm not so chuffed about. I don't like how they've semi like half the link like that, but the whole push to adjust, this is a much better system than they originally had um, on their Seamasters and models. I think this is so much more you know, standout, easier to look at. It doesn't seem like it's tacked on at all. I mean, this is such a welcome change. I don't know why it's taken them so long to put a push to micro adjust on a Speedmaster. I mean, they're, even the, the Ed Whites and the latest Speedmaster models, the professionals, the 3861s, they're still using holes, holes on the clasp. How can you, how, I mean, you know, it's that just quit, scratch, scratch my head. Um, more subtle contrast needed, light gray dial. Yeah, I like that forward. Good point there doesn't work it sure doesn't marco i know we've definitely meshing two different eras 40s and 60s and 70s yep that was my top uh, critique on it for sure putting a putting a standard you know the original ck cases on would look good clasp still doesn't compare to rolex let's be honest no it doesn't they they are different animals they are different animals but in a different way i will say that i do like how easy the adjustment on the fly is with this next to submariner bracelets and easy links actually because you, especially the Submariner bracelet, it's a lot less finicky. These have two or three adjustments where the Submariner, you have to pull, you have, it's, it's more movement required. You have to take it, you have to open it, and you have to like lift and move across. It's a bit of an awkward movement where this, it's one, two, three clicks, close it, you're done. It's a much faster process, which I like. But then when it comes to that diversity of adjustments, I mean, the Submariner has a lot more options. Yeah, so we've we definitely chat about this watch to death. I did a video about it if you'd like to hear a bit more about the design and see some renders. I do like it in rose gold. It looks pretty good. It does look pretty good. Uh, oh my God, due to the eclipsing, eclipsing Omega, <laughs> I'd prefer this to a Rolex class. Yeah, I mean, another thing that is not often mentioned, I tried to do that in the video when I compared Omega with the, with the Explorer. If you stick your fingernail under this clasp and try and pull it open, from the back, it won't budge. If you stick a fingernail under any Rolex clasp, you will adjust the micro adjust system unintentionally, which is a little bit of a safety, <laughs> feels clunky, not safe. Yeah, yeah, okay, we're gonna carry on. I've chatted about this watch way too much. Shame, chronoscope, yeah, unfortunate. What else do we have next? Oh, okay, what is this about? This just caught the corner of my eye, and I thought it looked great to chat about. Um, there's some good stuff. Got Vacheron, Laurent Ferrier, Patek, Moza coming up next. I'm looking forward to this. So there was actually mention in the chat a second ago about Navi timers. I had missed it in the chat. That there was there was a link about Navi timers and how it's a better watch for the price and all that stuff. This is to like celebrate some American Airlines partnership, and I thought as far as a B01 goes. Not that bad. I do prefer it on leather. Yeah, we, we're looking at every all the aspects. It's very, it's very blue. Yeah, I'm looking at it now and finding it quite, quite excessive. I must say, like they, they've definitely chucked a lot of blue in there. You notice these hands they've used with the chrono. What's it called? Top time. That's the one. Top time. Uh, carrying on through. Do we have any live pictures? All these. Oh no. Hmm. I'll just leave that here for everyone to enjoy. We love <laughs> Pan Am. <laughs> I like it. America, Kivasha says. Uh, <laughs> Chili Badger, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mason. Yeah, it was, a, it was an old video. I think I did it a couple of, couple of weeks back. So, or draw the dial more like a sketch on paper. Sorry, Forbin. I think we've missed that was the, the chronoscope story. I cannot stand printing a logo on a... <laughs> Why do, why do you do it? Why put it on the, why? It's so, ugh, so many brands do it and they, they haven't learned. We don't want to see this kind of decal on a sapphire back. You know, that's the, what's the point of a sapphire back? If you just go to obstruct it, it's like you're taking a photograph of a beautiful landscape in front of you and someone sticks their, <laughs> sticks their head right in front of you when you're trying to do it. You know, I don't get it. I just don't get it. It's a cheap method. I can understand that part. But there's so many other ways you can address it better. You engrave all this stuff. I'm sure you could just engrave American Airlines at the back here and be done with it that way. 
Oh no, <laughs> David says, yeah, we've gone we've past the two hour mark. Now I'm going to start ranting and raving. Um, I just kind of liked it because the colors were, were pretty interesting, even though it's, it's really excessive now that we look at it. Seeing it on the strap, though, it looks pretty good. Uh, it's you know, the issue with a lot of Navi timers is that they can be difficult to break up when you're looking at the components. I know that depending on the, the B09 or B06 or the 765 and typical Navi timers that we know, uh, contrast is everything with a pilot watch like this. And the way they've broken it up with colors, if I can zoom into it more, I don't know. The way they've broken up these elements with colors means that it's pretty easy to read at a glance once you learn how to use it. Um, it's not as, it is bright, but it's not as in your face, you know? Yeah, could go well with blue jeans. I think if you if you were a blue jeans wearer, this is like the number one. This is like a fashion watch for the blue jean wearer. Black date window, which is good. As far as Breitling designs, I mean, Megan hits it, um, talking about, Brightling is killing it with the way they have introduced so many great new movements that they're doing. The Top Time series, I love the Top Time series, probably my favorite that they're doing. The, the way they're doing the Super Oceans, and we could do a full show just on what Brightling's been up to at the moment. Um, I just, this case back, this case back, just, just. So again, it's American Airlines, if you missed it earlier. Don't know so much about the shark mesh on it either. It calls back to that time, but yeah. So my my commentary on this watch is I like how they've broken up the elements with colors to make it a bit more legible, easy to read, to break up. The five-minute marks, I like that component. We see that a lot with regatta timers and those. <laughs> Omega's 1159 2.0. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. So what, are we going to call the chronoscope the 1159 at this rate? Omega's 1159. That's just rude. That's just horrible. Um, I have the same reaction to this Brightling as those too many bright color Zodiacs. Yeah, right. <clears throat> this, does, this does remind me of Zodiacs in a similar way. It could use a denim jean strap. Yeah, like the like the Aquaterra. Okay, this one clearly hasn't won anyone over. May as well stick to the south of England seagull with a French fry in the beak on an exhibition seagull movement. Oh, man, that's that's a kick right there, Chile. And you're based in the south, right? Truman saying that Strange Tudor outsells Breitling with their B01. And, and yeah, right? I mean, that's the funniest part, right? Tudor is using Breitling's... Uh, so, so Breitling's using Tudor's standard automatic and Tudor's using their, their chrono. They're outselling Breitling. It's the same as I saw this post about Seiko's the other day that micro brands are competing with Seiko using all of their movements and outselling so many Seiko. Yeah, it's, it's industry, right? Using Seiko modules and their watches and selling them more than Seiko are selling their, their watches. I love it. I love it. Okay, we're going to move on. This one definitely hasn't rung true with everyone. Oh, here we go. Okay. I don't know what these are called officially. And I will be honest, I did not have a look at this when it was released. I just saw it and thought, hey, this is great that they've finally woken up to the fact that we all wanted to see this watch. Monochrome, get in there. <clears throat> all right. So what makes this watch cool? Uh, Corey Richards was given, he's a, he's a photographer, photographist. And he is an explorer. He likes to climb mountains. He took uh, one of these models, a, a one of one titanium piece on an expedition up to Everest. He didn't make the climb that year, but it was just such a cool piece because it was a piece unique. It had a fully engraved, like a 22 carat rotor. I don't know if they feature it in the article. Let's have a look if they do. Uh, do they? Well, there he is. Yeah. And there's the watch. Did they mention, they show us the rotor? No, I don't think so. I really hope this is, I really hope this is the, I'm looking at the wrong watch, aren't I? Hold on a sec. Hold on. No, this is the, okay, this is the one. You see, it looks so similar, but they're different. Where's that movement shot gone? Come back. I had it a second ago. Wait. Uh, oh my. That'll do. <laughs> Only took a month. I think this is the original movement. Okay. So it made it special. I mean, it's got a full 22 carat gold rotor at the back. It's got Everest engraved back there. It's really special. One of one. Uh, and I don't, I don't quote me. I don't know if this is the original or if this is the modern one. I, again, haven't looked at this release fully. But what they've done essentially is bring out the watch that we all wanted to see. They brought it out in titanium as the standard. This is the original. Hold on. They brought out a standard overseas dual time and then they've brought out a chrono. 
And this is a great looking chrono as well. The overseas has gotten so much attention to it now. Chatting about titanium watches, we're seeing it again and again, right? This VC is an improvement. Yeah, not everyone's a fan of the overseas line. I love, I mean, the stealth factor on this watch is another level. Who doesn't love a 1655 Explorer? Well, there we go. You've got the option. Um, worldwide NH35 shortage. I did not know that, Eric. So I'm going to catch up with the chat again. I'm sorry that I missed you, as always. Terrible back. Uh, yeah, everyone seems to like texture dial strap combo works well. It's just beautiful. It's so, so good. It's it's such an elegant looking dual time chrono as well. You know, you've got easy to adjust elements. I love the orange accents, the texture to the finish. There's the chrono. Funny how the chrono almost feels a bit generic. You know, that's not the watch that everyone's been looking at. It's It's the standard dual time that everyone is enjoying looking at. The chrono does look a bit too, you know, safe. How can you say safe about a watch like this? <clears throat> but it just doesn't look very exciting next to the, the standard fuel time. Carrying on to Jim Little saying, what uh, what makes the VC overseas Everest fuel time cool? Everything. Yep. Only 150. So just as they did a piece unique of the standard one of the, of the Corey Richards model, so they've only made 150 of these. It's a shame. It's a travesty. I mean, oh. This is the one titanium watch that I think collectors would go crazy for. Um, I mean, what else can we say about it? There's there's so much to take in. It feels like a real adventurer's watch. It's a it's a proper little sports watch. Uh, you know, casual, understated, but has all the ruggedness that you would want. I believe I'm gonna have a look at the at the description, but I think this is a different coating of titanium. It has some kind of anthracite finish to it, or maybe it's carbotanium or ceramic or something. I'll have a look in a moment. Uh, Bark and Jack says that it's his Grail. Oh yeah, I mean, as far as a Grail goes, this is definitely one of them. It's sublime. It's it's also what I find amazing is it's it's, it's an icon at this stage. I think it's one that's managed to capture so much attention especially the the dual time look how safe the chrono looks next to it the chrono doesn't look exciting at all isn't it weird uh cordura here we go again with bloody cordura i don't even uh 41 mil diameter excellent size with multiple finishes sapphire crystal front back multiple finishes that's really specific um gray cordura fabric strap God. combined titanium and steel with multiple finishes providing contrast emphasizing certain elements Six-sided bezel, lateral pushes, crown. Yeah, we're talking about the chrono now. Yeah, I think all of us are just looking at the dual time because that's the that's the beauty. It's a 42 mil, which is pretty nice. No hacking seconds. I can't, that's amazing. Truman, thanks for that point. Isn't it funny that the higher you go up in the horterology space, so watches lose their hacking function? Yeah. But it's just awesome. It's it's so nice to see this watch getting the recognition it deserves. I, I dedicated a whole video to this watch because I thought it was worth sharing. This was like three years ago or something. Um, yeah. Watches in general, there's it's just a rabbit hole upon more rabbit holes. Perfect Grail watch. It sure is. It sure is. I'm sorry. Again, let's see what's going on. He didn't make it to the top of the Everest because the watch was too Vatican. <laughs> yeah, the story goes that the weather was just terrible that year. That must suck. Eh? Imagine climbing. You know, to that final point, that thirty, that last thirty-minute mark, where it's go or leave. You know, it's the no-go zone. You either commit or you turn back. Um, I think it was just very windy that year, and it sucked. Didn't work out for him. Great texture on the dial. I mean, how else can we describe it? It's also good to see that they're so adventurous with the different color choices used and materials. I th it's worked in this watch's favor. Um, that maybe the issue with the standard overseas is that it's almost too flat in many ways. It does have polished elements to it. Um, this also verified that Vacheron's movements are much more hardworking and, you know, they, they give you that, that seal of approval that these are workhorse movements, a workhorse watch. Yeah, it's great. Nothing says luxury like Cordura <laughs> hitting the coffee again. I haven't looked up what Cordura is as a fabric, but it's, you know, it's it's a hallmark name, trademark name. It's to do with nylon. It's to do with a certain weave that they use. Lion on the GS case back. Oh, Mark II. Another thing I just cannot get. I just don't understand. Do not understand. Um, and Karen on one false step ever rest. <laughs> That's a very good line there, Al. I like that. 
that sounds like something Tolkien would say, you know. Uh, okay, I'm going to carry on through. Beautiful watch. I think it's worth all the attention it's getting. One of the most excellent dual time pieces out there as far as GMTs go, as far as, you know, an explorer's watch goes. It, it fulfills so many categories at once. I think that's why it's getting the recognition it needs. Right. And on to, okay, this is also a real goodie. This one caught my attention because it's something you don't see very often from Laurent Ferrier, and it's the limited edition homage to. When I searched this at one stage, I got lots of wine bottles. So I hope, okay, there we go. Uh, professional watches. Yeah, it's a professional. Uh-oh. Connections are pri Uh-oh, not, not letting me in. For some reason, uh, I'm getting a bit of a feedback problem that side. Okay, let's just have a look at maybe Hype Beast would work. Her dinky I can't go into. Okay, a blog to watch would probably do better. Laurent Ferrier, watchmaking fanatic, beautiful movements, beautiful pieces, atypical design to what we normally see. Normally, we have the, the typical Asagai style hands, all those elements. Now we're looking at something that looks like it fell off the, the Longines bandwagon. And I thought this was worth discussing. I, oh, Box and Russo. Of course, this was a Phillips collaboration. Yeah, that's it. I'm looking at the type. Original concepts, um, homage to series, focuses around blah, blah, blah. This has, has the salmon dial elements. You can see that this was a bit of a collaboration piece, the way it was all thrown together. You know, it has it has the hallmarks that you would you would expect from Box and Russo. I mean, they, like salmon dials, Phillips auctions, always the big thing. The most expensive oh that's right i did our 76 um the most expensive omega ever sold today 3.4 the ck2915 yeah let's pull that up quick chatted about the chronoscope uh just as we're going through ck2915 phillips yeah this one's made some some serious headway huh now what i find so great about these watches i don't know why we're segueing onto this after just looking at Laurent Ferrier is uh oh, hold on a sec i'm seeing adidas saying something else about collecting picked up my first last one the seed well oh the one two what a good watch that's the 43 one two six six zero zero huge congrats adidas that's that is a dream of a watch congratulations yeah so this this was the record winner the record holder for for omega something like 2.5 million pounds it went for tropical dial three two one CK2915, it's the first gen Speedmaster with a broad arrow hand. What's not to love? They are so good. What I find crazy, I've said this for years now, actually, that when we look at Submariners and GMTs and all those, they come up every single show. It's seldom that you see the CK2913s, the original Chronos, this trio of watches. They are actually rare because they were beaten so badly <laughs> back in the day. They were bought and abused. And you don't see them in good condition. They they pretty much disintegrated. So seeing these watches get the recognition is great, I think. It's great that they deserve it now. Um, I don't know what this means now for the broad arrow space. I really hope that my watch, you know, that the trilogy edition, and they don't go up in price because I'll suck. Um, you know, but they, they've always been sleepers and it's good to see. I've been very fortunate to get hands on with one of these in the past and they are as good as they look. It's so different. I mean, this is a Speedmaster. Doesn't look like one. It doesn't feel like a Speedmaster either. It's it's so nice. Okay, sorry about that tangent. That was fun. Ron Ferrier, let's get the image up again. So you can see this is a collaboration piece. I do really like that black dial model. Also love the case back. I found this to be interesting just because it's very unlike what Laurent Ferrier does with his pieces. Here we have something that feels like it. Pretty much 1940s era. Very true to form, railroad track, small seconds, rotating numerals around the dial. Is it me or do the lines between the numerals give a motion effect? Yeah, right. I didn't actually, I didn't take in the numerals too much when I saved the image, but I must say it does give you this feeling that you want to move your eyes around the dial a bit more, don't you think? There is this, you know, if there were arrows on each, on each number, I mean, on each um, segment, would make the flow a bit easier, make it look like there's there's some movement to it. I like that point. And the fact that the quarters are a little bit larger and they rotate around the dial instead of just being your typical ones in front, it's just clean, very interestingly done. Uh, limited production of 32 watches. I mean, I think it's stainless steel and available 32 
Swiss francs. I'm sure these are still available. You might be able to find them. Maybe not. Box and Rousseau, Phillips Partnership. I'm sure these disappeared quite quickly. I just have to clear my throat quickly. Hold on a sec. I'm going to mute myself. So great to be able to mute your voice once in a while. Hitting the coffee. Coming back to you. This is the case style the chronoscope should have had. Oh, talking about the CK. Yes, that's exactly it. And these original straight lugs. I don't know why Omega doesn't double down and bring more of these out because they really are so nice. Just so out of the way, not in your face. They could play around a bit more with brushing elements like that, but yeah, I love it. This didn't even be this wasn't even sold on a bracelet. I mean, how crazy, how crazy is the world today? Okay, so we've chatted about the Ron Ferry. I don't think many of us are that too keen. It looks good, but it also doesn't really speak his language normally. A bit of a bullet hole through the six o'clock. <laughs> yeah, right. It does. It sure does. The sub seconds, yeah, it can work, can be a bit of a detractor. Six of dials are some of the best dress watches. Yeah, they look great. I mean, there's so many options for them today, too. In fact, I think I did save the um the B01. No, not the the, the Baltic, what's it called? MR01. We're going to chat about. Oh, God. Now we're going to get technical. Let's see if I can get these names right. Patek Flyback Chronograph, Annual Green, 5905. Hmm. Let's see. We have chatted about the green dial craze and about how Patek has gone down the road of the Nautilus and you know so many of their watches, they're introducing a green. Now, what made this one special I think some of us here have experienced this watch in hand. <clears throat> Holding the sec, clearing the throat again. I don't know why my throat's so bad. Probably because I was watching rugby and uh, and T20 cricket today. So I guess I was shouting a bit too much. On Anyway, so what makes this watch good is that it's stainless steel for the first time. And it's a full annual calendar chrono with a flyback complication, I believe. It also has a flyback. Olive green dial is something they're trying to do. And I love the point. If, if Jean-Claude Beaver is still watching the show, he mentioned a point about how all the attention is now on the steel Nautiluses. And it's such a good way for them to reintroduce the idea that this is what Patek's known for as a brand. This is what has defined them in the past. Can I get full screen, please? Yeah. This is what's defined them in the past. And, you know, bringing the, 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 the crazed enthusiast collector into this realm of looking at steel watches in this category of being a calendar watch, it's an interesting move. But one thing that bugs me the most about this, uh, <laughs> Russell bracelets, yeah, Aquanaut bracelet is definitely a, a either hit or a miss. Look at the difference between the render image and the real image. Notice how the green is very different. This is an emerald and this is an olive. And I don't know why Patek goes with emerald for their render and olive in the real world. I would want to see my watch with the, with the emerald dial instead of olive, personally. Uh, purple sunburst. Oh, God, who mentioned that? That was um, the reduced speed master. Hold on a sec. What's going on? Um, beautiful piece. No, I missed that. I would love a purple sunburst dial, Ada says. Uh, well, Megan mentioned earlier that it would be good to see a purple dial watch coming out soon but the green craze is just everywhere it's happening so much now um we're seeing everything from i mean we had the glasuta at the beginning of the show i deliberately shared that because it's just a part of the, the talking point 57 11 the aquanauts all going green i mean rolex with their pieces tudor i mean so many watches out there today it's it's the latest color to jump on and the bracelet, I think most of us can agree tim tim saying don't like the bracelet if anyone's tried an aquanaut bracelet on before you'll know doesn't really suit the watch very well. Uh, it's I, I do really appreciate that it's the subtlety that makes this watch work in a way. You can you can see that it's oh that's nice. It's a bit flashy, but it's not overly flashy considering it's a full annual calendar chrono and has all the complication you would want from a Patek. It's really yeah, it's really olive, not emerald, and it's yeah, it's, it's weird, right? Look at the difference in color. Right hand side is the real one. Left hand side is the render. I don't know how they managed to get that through quality control. They've they've done the same with the Nautilus. The Nautilus is much more of an olive finish than an emerald. Still, not a bad looking watch. And oh, check the movement out. Pretty great. And the fact that it's in steel, I think, will definitely garner attention. Shall we have a look at the price of this machine? Bear in mind that these have only ever been produced in white gold. And I think 
rose gold, if I remember. I can't. They did. Did they ever bring it out on a bracelet? Um, they did. I'm sure they did. Uh, we've actually featured this watch on Wrist Shot Week a couple of years back, and it was the white gold model, of course. They discontinued it. Had a black dial with a red second hand. It was very nice. Fifty one point five euros. Stainless steel, three polished link stainless steel bracelets, flyback automatic movement. Yeah. So the novelty around this watch, I think, is the fact that it is celebrating the movement and the watchmaking of this watch and is getting the collector community to look at what makes the the, the real Patek name proud. It's not the steel craze for the Aquanauts and the Genta designs. It's now looking at the steel craze, focusing on the complication instead of just the watch, which I find pretty good. Right. And carrying on through to the next one in the selection, this is a real heavy hitter, and I would never remember these references if I didn't have cheat sheets. 52004R. This is amazing. I mean, this is true Patek in all its glory. And I like that these, these pages are actually dedicating whole articles to one watch <laughs> because they did come out as a trio. So slate gray, rose gold finish. This is really exceptional. I mean, I think it's the, what, what was the model? It's the 5202 is the one that everyone looks at as just grail. Yeah, 5204. <laughs> Mr. Beaver is in the chat. It's good to have you here. And Russell, you know these watches as well. So <laughs> do people use 316 stainless? Uh, Adidas is asking. asking. 316L, uh, yeah, that's the typical material. Um, 904L, by the way, is not something that is new by any means. It wasn't something that Rolex like patented. Uh, 904L has been used with a lot of watches in the past. It's just a bit more expensive as a metal. It's a yeah. And if, if you really want good stainless steel, you have to go Zin. Zin tegmented stainless steel is probably the best on the market. Um, doesn't make it more attainable than steel. No, it doesn't. It actually makes it worse. So they've moved their attention away from the Nautilus realm and now pushed their, their high complication pieces in steel on people. And so the, the craze in the market's going to go that way again. So this is the full package. It's an annual calendar, chrono, split seconds, and I think it's also a flyback. It's a rattra punt. It's just too cool. It's just got everything. Stepping to the case. This is for the, the superior uh, Patek aficionado who loves just complexity for complexity's sake. Um, oh, look at that movement. Whoops, come back. It's so good. They, they really are celebrating their watchmaking here. And I think most in the chat, like I would say, Mr. Jean Beaver, Mr. Well, Russell, Marco would probably love this piece too. Uh, steel seems to be less obtainable than precious metal high end brands. That's just it. That is just it, man. Um, and the question is what's going to happen? It's, it is laughable to consider how steel prices are still climbing and <laughs> climbing. And the precious metal isn't looked at as much. Uh, and it's it's that debate on you know, where is this world going? What are we thinking? Why doesn't VC get enough love? Adidas says, we're talking about their overseas because that's definitely gone out the window. Now everyone's going mad for them. I think VC has, you know, in this kind of ballpark with models like, you know, their traditionals, they do some good stuff. It's just not not an area that people have really expanded in and looked at more. Um, would love it more if it was automatic. Just I mean, yeah, that's what you. An automatic perpetual is something that I think a lot of us would probably like. Realistically, if you're wearing this every day, I don't know. Maybe it's just because we're lazy. You want to appreciate winding the watch, but at the same time, yeah, it's just it's a good piece. It's just so so good. There are many other pieces out there, though. I mean, I don't know if this is the the quintessential like the Grail Grail of Patek watches. I'm not that well attuned. Um, Rolex don't show their backs. They don't. If stainless steel is worth more with its weight in gold, why can't I sell my pans for a few thousand? <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Beautiful looking watch. Super high complicated. And I thought well worth looking at. Yeah. Appreciate the wind. The one. Also, a good thing to mention here is that they do not skimp on the size of their crowns. Isn't it nice that you have a huge crown to wind the watch with? Nothing worse than having a skinny little crown when it's a manual wind piece. Yeah. Also, something I've just noticed, I've got two images of the same up on the screen. On the left-hand side, these are actually loom-filled batons and hands. So this watch is much more legible. You can read it in the dark. And it modernizes the piece a bit. 
normally these would just be applied gold elements. They wouldn't be any you know luminescent material. It would be Romans or something added to it, maybe. Good to see that this is a bit more of a modern direction. And then contrasted with the stepped lugs, which is like so, so old school. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on next. And this one is probably has been the least uh, accepted. I think a lot of us have been scratching our heads with this one. Of, of the three, I don't know. This one doesn't really fit in the category. And let's get to an article. Monochrome just keeps doing it again. So this is a platinum. Platinum World Time Chrono. Let me try and get so it's hold on, full thing. Platinum World Time Chronograph. I think it's it's not a split, no. But I mean, also just insane complication that it's using. Realistically, it's got, it's got everything and more. Uh, do we have any live images of this watch? Well, we do have a movement. It's automatic, so that's something you can enjoy. Uh, so Mega says that uh, PC is not in the same league way down the ladder. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> yeah, as far as I just don't think they get the attention because maybe people just don't appreciate the aesthetics as much. Um, it's funny how the overseas has caught on. It's taken some time, but it definitely has caught on. The traditional series, the the way they do their tribute pieces to like 1956, the 1921 Historic American, all of those models are just so grand. As for this model, though, head scratcher for a lot of us, I think. The world time is a great complication. Would you want to chronograph with your world time? That's the question. I asked someone like Russell in the chat, would you want a, a world time chrono? Since you own both separately, would you want one as one piece? It is amazing to think that they've just double stacked these modules, that you push this button on the side to adjust where you are in the world, and then you have the two buttons on the right to set the chrono and let it run. Looks like it's a 30-second, 30 30-minute 30 chrono counter, so nothing too insane, but yeah. VC isn't consistent. Yeah, Justin, I like that point very much. I like that point very, very much. Yes, as far as the world time goes, what else? 39 mil. I mean, that's a that's a crazy small diameter for a watch like this. 39 and a half mils. I mean, it'd be so difficult to read. <laughs> Just in general, telling the time, <laughs> reading all the plots. Bottle green, they're calling it. Pity they don't have any real like live live images to look at. Maybe this this looks pretty legit though. Yeah, I mean, I think they got this color right. If this is an authentic image, I I do prefer that color. But this now reminds me of of snakeskin in a way, you know, lizard skin, which is not the kind of thing you really want on your watch dial. I don't know, alien. Yeah, I'd agree to that. I'll, uh, yeah, let's carry on in the chat if I can catch you and see if I can. Abdul is leaving us. I mean, most of you, most of you guys, it's like what <clears throat> quarter to one in the UK. Wherever you are in the world, it's probably getting the time is marching on quite a bit. So. Uh, thank you all for joining in, as always. Uh, does look like snakeskin in the flesh. Russell, God, oh, that's funny. That is so funny. And do you want a snakeskin? I mean, that's that ages the watch immediately, don't you think? White looks fine because it's not so in your face, but I think the green just, uh, it's a little bit much. Okay, let's move on next. Really cool set of pieces, though, all in all. Given the choice between the three, hmm, I think I would just go for this. Why not? This is like, Patek Swan song. Just go for an amazingly cool example and get get the full business. If you can, get the full. Carrying on next to 23. Okay. What is this called? The Moser Heritage Burgundy something or other Burgundy dial. Yep. <clears throat> Dual time. Now, Moser has done some good stuff this year. They really have to release some good stuff. Monochrome again. On the ball. Sorry, I just hit the mic. This is such a beautiful color. I think all of us are, are quite taken by the finish to this piece. And here's the thing, though. Does the aesthetic of the dial work with that color? I don't know so much. <laughs> Party's just getting started here. Yeah, right, 2, 2 a.m. Um, nice engine turning. It is. I mean, you can't ever uh, trump the engine turning when it comes to, to Patek. This stuff is so, so clean. Stamped pad dial. Not feeling this one. Give me the Khaleesi all day. And the Khaleesi being the uh, the Cloisonne, Cloisonne finish. And Karen in the chat. Let's see what's going on. I'm missing you here. Lizard, lizard lick dial. Okay. So yeah, the, what I'm finding conflicting about this is I love the color. I think Moser has so much potential with, with this color for a lot of their pieces. They have already with the Endeavors and with the um, Pioneers and all of those. We have this feeling as a group that Burgundy is going to be something that's going to be explored. 
I know that JLC with a reverso has gone with Burgundy in the past, so this is something they could go go nuts with. But I'm just wondering if this color works with a watch that's basically 1920s inspired, you know, 1930s. It's a real pilot watch through and through with the wire lugs. Hmm. Oh, here we go. Here's the original. Now that, that's funny. I'm talking about this watch, but that looks infinitely better to me, <laughs> right? Yeah, that looks infinitely better. I love that slate gray. That's what speaks to the style of the watch, you know? Hmm. Uh, are you using... Uh, yes, I am for close enough. What am I... The, yeah, I didn't even know. We're talking about the... um. What is that term again? I can't... That name. Hold on a sec. I've never heard... I've never heard... Never understood the name of Khaleesi on a watch style. Maybe someone could maybe tell me as a as a collector what Khaleesi has to do with that element i've always thought of it as close an a right isn't that supposed to be it yeah it's a crazy loom i mean that's that's it this this does feel like a tool watch a pilot watch i would imagine it's in white gold i have to have a look i haven't looked at the spec sorry but slate gray finish i think just ties it up so nicely it just speaks to that element oh my goodness and this is just this is just wrong so we've been talking about this piece, but we're just getting infinitely better watches as we go through. This tourbillon is just, oh, it's so good. Moser just keeps hitting it out the park. Not so much with this one, but these are great. Hitting the coffee again. Fume dial too. Yeah, right. Um, carrying on in the chat. Let's see what else is going on. Oh, JCB's off to lunch. It must be like, what? Can't be midday that side. Maybe 10, 10 p.m. that side. Yeah, enjoy your day. Sunday, that side. Um, so Joe's saying, if the case was rose gold, it would be killer. Yeah, I I'm sure they've done a rose gold variant. Look at that tourbillon. What a cool finish. I'm wondering if they should have put two plots here on either end just to tie up the, the numerals around the dial, but so beautiful. This speaks to its time well. <clears throat> yeah, this is, a f this is a funky combo. Is this the first time they've used a dual time? I would imagine it is. The first time they've used a dual time with this piece before. Um your voice sounds older than how you look. Your Kovacs, I think I saw that comment the other day. I, I, I don't know how that works out. Like when I was in high school, I was a um, a treble. Yeah. And I think I ended up as a tenor two by the time I left high school. I don't know. Don't know what to say. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's good to have range. And I think you, you can, you know, it's all down to register and being able to speak really deep if you have to. And then you can raise it up and adjust and moderate um you know puberty affects us differently i guess for me it's cool long jean big eyes beauty yep gotta love it this colorway i'm not i'm not digging now seeing this in the flesh funny to say i just find it so it just conflicts with that style of the piece from the time it's supposed to be based on you know 11 45 in australia okay okay i was close not really but thanks, thanks for that uh, i'm sipping layer cake marshmallow chocolate stars that sounds dangerous uh, the Moses hour numerals are upright. The minute numerals are faced. No, hold on, hold on a sec. The Moser, the Moses hour numerals are upright. The minute numerals face into the dial wrong. Sean says, "Huh? Yeah." I'm one thing that I've I can't really get my head around with this is that it doesn't have any kind of finishing around the numerals itself. And the numerals are just you know planted, planted onto the dial. Hmm, it's a funky one. And then you have these small running numerals on the dial. I mean, it is beautiful. Would you call this burgundy, though? <clears throat> That's what they are calling it, burgundy hands. This feels more like red grape, you know, red wine. <laughs> Layer cake, marshmallow, chocolate stout, chili badger. What? How is that even a thing? I mean, I'm going to be getting a, a whiskey soon that has supposedly has like Christmas cake notes to it, which is going to, it sounds great, but I don't know. Yeah, upscale Shinola. Oh, that's that's a kick. That's a kick, right, right low. And I also really dig what they do here with the way they finish the the sides of the case. Uh, it's just beautiful. Yeah, I must say, I've never really been a fan of how they finish off this piece. Isn't it bad? Like the closer you look to them, you kind of like start scratching your head. That slate gray dial is beautiful. I don't know so much about this. This feels a little bit jarring, and everything that Moser does is beautiful. So it's not. It's not for everyone, but I think, yeah, it's worth looking at. Uh, these these pilot style pieces are pretty great. The photography is just so good. It's amazing, the colorway. I just can't get over it. The movement's beautifully done. 
Moser is just in their own little echelon and they keep on just bringing winners day by day. Uh, it appears more maroon in these picks, not Bergen. Yeah, right. I'm having a closer look. I don't know. I'm getting this this grape kind of feel, but I, I don't know. Could be wrong. No, grape is much more purple. Maroonish, burgundy, who knows? I think it's a beautiful, another beautiful Moser. I mean, as collectors go, I mean, you can't not love these watches. Adding these pieces to a collection... I'm wondering what they did with this hand, if it's like some kind of coating they finished it with. I don't know. We could be at this for days, but this is just... You know what's also taking my attention away is that they haven't actually applied the Mozo name to the dial. It's just a small, a subtle engraving underneath where here we have the name there, which is so much... Oh, God, this is so good. Okay, ladies and gents, let's have a vote. Which would you rather have? L for left, R for right. I'll start. I'll start this one going... <laughs> R for right, L for left. Which would you choose? It's difficult. If some of you out there who maybe are difficult to struggle with your left and rights like I do, uh, Chili Badger would go left. Let's see what the rank, what the ranking is. If you had, if you had either, either option, just to choose one, which would you go for? I must say that's slate gray. Oh, it's so good. Um, let's see. Lots of R's. Uh, looks of things. <laughs> R from Truman. Uh, the gray or blue dials are classic for Moser Heritage. I feel the green, crimson, strong. Thanks for that, Thomas. Yeah, isn't it funny? It pushes it pushes that burgundy finish into a different genre almost, a completely different category of it. Burgundy. So we have more L's. Huh. Both. <laughs> Easy enough to say both, yeah. X, I mean, that's useful. So it is quite divided. I think we all have our own taste. Another question is, I mean, this is a good one to ask. You're getting a Moser. This maybe is your only Moser in your collection. What would you rather have? A very basic looking piece that would blend into the background. It could easily just be a pilot watch. But then you have something like this that's exuberant, that stands out, that says Moser. <laughs> your military left. Yeah. Thanks, lefties. I thought it was just me. Yeah, I must say, uh, we're talking about left and right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not the best with it. Carrying on through. To the next no okay let's have a look at this little thing i, I know this is not this is not everyone's cup of tea i did a video of this watch it's definitely been one that's stuck in my in my mind over the last and that's just it that's just it something colored i think that'll always win the day out especially when you're getting into moser territory okay so yeah the, the mr01 had quite the quite the flash sale when it came out uh pirate's choice are funny thing about uh pirate but this is like super tangent by the way forbin um i don't know how i don't know if you know this but how the pirates you know turn of phrase became a thing was because of treasure island actually um the disney film they made in the 50s and the actor who played long john silver was actually a um, actor for lots of shakespeare stuff and if if you're going true historic Shakespeare, you speak with more of an R, more of like a, a rolling accent if you want to get the, the real true way they spoke back then. Anyway, he used some of that Shakespeare influence into his portrayal as a pirate and because of his expression and his action of speaking that way. So that became the, the general you know way that people speak in the Robert Newton. Yeah, that's him. That's him talk like a pirate day oh my god okay carry on so that's weird like super weird trivia we just went down i guess the coffee's obviously working now salmon dial finish i i guess it is cliche that they introduced it they're referring to the the cat Cal 96 for this charles lawton i'm gonna look up his name hold on a sec let me just get this on full screen as i uh hold on get this shot up yeah so there have been lots of critiques but i think i think the pros outweigh the cons on this piece uh, let's see if I can find his name quickly. Uh, 1950, right? That was it. And his name was Robert Newton. Yep. Long John Silver. Yep. That's it. The st a stage R. Micro rotor, beautiful dial. I th it's the detail, right? That's just it. That's what I want to try and bring home is that it's it's a micro brand that has segued themselves into a, a place using the aesthetics we want to see. It's so simple to explain. Using the aesthetics that we want to see, break our numerals, large leaf hands, nice asymmetric arrangement. Everything's polished and it's applied. Nothing's painted on. And you're also getting an awesome micro-rotor movement at the back. Uh, the size is decent. It's not too small, not too big. 
Uh, not for everyone. I think, yeah, they kind of went on the nose with the salmon finish, but as a package, what a standout. And Newton played Long John Silver in the Disney version. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Um, Tristan to Takuna inhabitants still talk that way. Oh my God. I don't know what's going on now. See, when I bring up these things, Hunchback of Notre Dame, 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 whatever you want to say. Yeah, right. It just doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. I mean, look at the finishing and the way the cases were done. And yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. And the movement as well. Uh, how many photographs did they take of this watch? Go. Hold on. We'll get there eventually. I know it takes a bit of time for the audio to buffer through, but impressive seriously impressive and the, the best thing of all was seeing this watch up for sale i mean once these watches hit the gray market people, people were starting to scratch their heads they were charging like a thousand bucks for these things because everyone wanted one yeah yeah it was pretty funny um, whoops i called tin salmon dial tinned salmon dial yeah micro brand maybe a leaping salmon dial <laughs> sub dial proportions are just a tad too large relative to the rest of the dial yeah freddie i am um, i did a video on this piece what did i say I did try and play around with the subdial arrangements. Nothing worked as as well as I thought it would. It was quite a quite a difficult exercise taking this and shifting it around and trying to find something that would stick. I think the size it does work pretty well for this package, especially if you I, I said this in the video, put a Fibonacci spiral around it and follow the dial. There's this great I love the relationship between the nine and the six and how they counteract one another. There's a there's a reflection. It's like a mirror image. Um and, and Megan nails it saying 600 bucks. How can you go wrong with a watch like this? It's it's such an affordable way of getting into a great little micro rotor dress watch with excellent finishing, texture, just great attention. Every little detail on the dial, hands, numerals, it did it well. Sector dial finishes too. Are people digging the new Explorer? Can't stand 36. Too small by metal is yuck. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure some of us out here would like to debate that one. Um, BDEV, I think I said hi to you. What do you think about the lug width? Yeah. So the lug width is 20. And the issue, we could say it's an issue, but also what makes it a bit more modern is that this wideness, the shoulders to the lugs do give it more presence on the wrist, which is a good thing. I have heard that the watch does wear very flat and the lugs are a bit of a detractor. But with a piece like this for 36 millimeters, we chatted about it actually talking through the, the Bulliver mill ships earlier on. A watch that goes from 41 mils tapering down to 16 is a little bit extreme, but 41 down to 18 is a great, great in-between. I think it works well. I've actually been wearing my, my big eye, which is a 41, on a 18 mil Phoenix NATO, and it feels good. It actually does seem to bring the scale down and give it a bit more of a comfortable look. So I like that point, BDEV. If they were to bring the strap size from 20 down to 18 and get it to hug the wrist a little bit more, it would probably feel even more elegant. Maybe that's something that they could think about. But this case is a generic case that Baltic now uses. They've, they've run it with their um, sector dial series they did beforehand, all the classic classic models. Um, <laughs> I think Mark too is catching up on the show, watching the, uh, the Patek. He's still on the Pateks at the moment, mentioning ugly Aquanaut bracelets. <laughs> Otherwise, lovely. Yeah, that was that was a while back. Um, so this watch is becoming a social. Yes, it is. It's full on social media. Down. I think it's 36. Hold on. I could be wrong. 36, 38. I can't get out of this image. Hold on. I'm pretty sure it's 36 mils. Yeah, Diamond is only 36. So it's become a social media darling. I think a lot of us have been sharing this watch. I love it because the design feels so correct. It could you could say it's pieced together as a greatest hits watch, but at the same time, I love the fact that it's affordable and that the design is there and you're getting such a cool looking watch for such a good price. Something that's quite consistent in this show, actually. Um, and talking about two tones, yeah, two tone explorers, definitely a divisive subject. We chatted about it so many times before. I think it's it's one that's going to be infinite debate from now on. Um, similar to the, the bluesy, how the, how the bluesy sub gained popularity through the 90s, and that's now considered an icon and a classic. Okay, next up, uh, this is the 43 millimeter uh, AP Offshore. I, they, they always bring out a new model. I can't keep track of. Uh oh, I can't keep track of what's happening, where it's happening. But we'll see March March 2021. Can't be. I know they brought out a new series like later on. Hold on. They brought out new colors. Here we go. 
five new models. Oh, geez. So many of them. There's like a Fume dial. The one on the left, just just uh, ignore the one on the left-hand side. This is um, an earlier edition, I think. Now, what, what grabbed my attention was all of this. <clears throat> On their social platforms, their social handles like Instagram, the advertising for the offshore is is parkour, just parkour everywhere. Once you put this watch on, you parkour. <laughs> it's, just, it's just too much to take in. Uh, Bdev is leaving us. Thanks for hopping in, Bdev. Um, the Baltics are everywhere. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, and talking about sizes now, I don't know. What sort of, uh, looks like Patek five seven zero in my eyes. Maybe a little too much. Talking about the the, the um, Baltic. Yeah, so seeing this watch being advertised, I don't know if this is a, a recent thing, but just guys wearing these watches and climbing on buildings, I find it to be such a head-scratching way of marketing an AP Offshore because every single comment in the Instagram posts that they were leaving was, yeah, the first thing I think about when I put on my Offshore is to go climbing buildings, you know? I guess, I guess in a way they're trying to make it hip and modern and stuff but i'm um, mentioning about g-shocks and meccano and i mean yeah the offshore has always been that bulked up variant these new ones hmm, the 143 mil offshore that's caught all of our attention i think it was in q1 it was released was that tourbillon that they did was it a tourbillon i think it was 43 mil tourbillon was amazing <laughs> i climb buildings most days russell says right uh the human fly yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a strange bit of advertising. I guess it worked. Um, I do like the whole urbanization where they've, you know, it's typical. It's it's the SUV lifestyle today. You're wearing you're wearing joggers and your sports shoes and your, you know, the the concrete surrounds. It does fit the the build of it all. But I just don't see how parkour factors in with the offshore line. Hey, it worked. I mean, we're talking about it, so it must have worked. You know, uh, dial also gets new finish. There's like fume and stuff. And it's just, we chatted about it last wrist shot week, actually. Uh, that'll be, it's one, a couple of, like a week back. The way that they just upscale everything on the offshore. They bring up the size of the tapisserie. They, you know, accentuate the pushes. They accentuate the strap. All of those little factors. The Black Panther. Yeah, that was, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Offshore on building. Yeah. I mean, look at that. Love the finish. I thought I had a feeling, a strange feeling that this there's a series that came out right recently in the last couple of months, but I guess I was wrong. This is this is old. Um, uh, Luke Ventus is joining us. Welcome, Luke. Uh, like the AP Royal Oak Offshore, always allows AP to be quite creative and bold. Yeah, right. I mean, the sad thing is they kind of worked themselves into a into a tight niche with the standard Royal Oaks. This is their way of being able to expand to add contrast and colors and. Wouldn't precious metals throw off your balance? <laughs> yeah, right? Right? You have that extra weight. I think these are all in steel. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, yeah. Oh, geez. They do come in precious metals. I don't know, man. That's a good point. You're jumping from building to building. Imagine whacking one of these things into the building. That would suck. Are these quick release? I really like that. Quick release tabs. More brands need to do it. I think people are starting to you know, subscribe to the times where spring bars are becoming less relevant and the quick release strap is like a part of the future it's so good bead blasted cases always look great yeah they do they do um ap just can't do wrong i think their stuff apart from the code 1159 <laughs> uh they, they do pretty damn well it only costs 56 euros not or 36.4 43 mil line available now so if you do have a big wrist and you feel like doing some parkour and you want to watch to accentuate your your travel through the air some extra weight maybe to help propel you a couple more feet. Go for the Mega Tapisserie 43 mil model. Uh, yes, specs are amazing, as you would probably imagine. Titanium looks like quite a bargain. Oh my, how is that steel is more expensive than titanium? Are you seeing this? 37 for the steel, 36 for titanium. Huh. Anyone out there who wants a lightweight watch in this category, I th that's that's something to, to note. Uh, okay, carrying on in the chat. I'll leave this on the screen for a sec while I get to you all. You can appreciate the movement. Yeah, I just don't get the parkour thing. This is weird. Uh, let's see. Russell mentioned something that I missed. Uh, double wrist. Uh, would love the uh, thing I've missed. I've seen a lot of these already. AP Marvel background. It's just nice. This time of the night, the chat quietens down a bit, so I'm able to just like collect what's going on. It's a little bit easier. 
many you can't fit third party straps when you do the strap oh difficult to change okay steel has a huge i just don't get that steel is a huge demand the offshore as a watch is pretty damn heavy i'm sure most of us would know that so being able to see it in titanium brings the weight down makes it a bit more wieldy because it is 43 mils it's quite a monster we'll probably wear like a 45 on the wrist why not go titanium and save yourself money <laughs> I don't know, man. The steel, the steel craze is ridiculous. And I mean, trust me, once we start seeing, if we see the Yacht Master released in titanium, titanium prices and demand for titanium watches is going to start climbing too. So it's just, what do we do? Jungle swinging vine to vine. I thought Amiga Planet Ocean and Sea Dweller were big until I saw IWC. Oh yeah, they, they get, they're much bigger. Talk about Panerize. Yep. Adidas 76. Panerize will make you swallow your words for sure. I love the design of this watch. I uh, won't be able to remember the name. We have five watches to go. And yeah, it's been a pretty good chat. Like as always, these have been very down to earth. Uh, not anything too, hold on a sec. This is it, right? I think this is it. Maybe not. Uh, it is, it is, it is. I like these a bit. So you notice we've gone to Zodiac twice today in this presentation. We started with the the world time and now we've jumped to a topper i believe it's a topper edition series and these designs look excellent um, if i can find some good shots look at the texture on it yeah i'm gonna try and catch up with the chat I, I i was on a train of thought and i missed it i was talking about the size of watches yeah they get worse and worse dial design of the zodiac is nice i'm impressed we chatted about that uh corey richards vacheron overseas titanium this to me that orange accent the text I mean, how can you not love that Super Seawolf text? It's so good. Um, also enjoy that they have negative, negative the numerals around it, so it's not too much in your face. There's texture to it too. Yeah, I think lots of people are jumping on the, the Zodiac bandwagon or jumping on the Zodiac if anyone is uh, from the Navy and likes likes those vehicles. Taking a hit from, I haven't had much of the Belvini. It's a tiny drop and there's still quite a bit left. Bonetto centurini strap eric that's a mouthful is that what these are called really cool i mean i, I like it's it all makes sense this is all structural integrity this ribbing is there to just add more emphasis and to support the holes wouldn't thought have said that out loud support the holes so what we have uh, there, there's a couple of pieces they have a, a, a broad series of different hands i don't know so much about these hands um phallic very phallic. every single every single one of these hands that's not that's not a good thing to have on your watch uh yeah spade style is what you could say spade mention of syringe carry forward i i they look a bit a bit mm, a bit mm. yeah i don't know i i think i like the way that zodiac keeps these because they line up with the court as well Maybe if they square these off a little bit more, they wouldn't look too vast difference, if you know what I mean. All right, so carrying on through. This is a great combo. I do really appreciate this. It's such a nice finish. Isn't it great when you see this kind of texture on a watch and it's all highlighted and pictured? Mm, that's the one. That's the one. Looking forward to my vintage Jack Daniels Makers Edition 43 proof. Oh, that's great. That is great. Blue Horizon. I don't know what's going on in the chat, but it's good. I mean, we, this is what happens. The three-hour mark, we start losing our heads a bit. Didn't catch what you were drinking earlier. Yeah, Belvini, Belvini 12. Um, my critique on it is that it should be a 43 or a 46. The 40% is super, super light. For a sherry cask finish, you want that staying power. I think it loses that a bit as a 40. Still, also, it's, it's so light and easy to drink, though. So uh, I can understand why people go through these bottles so fast. It really... <laughs> <laughs> really easy uh to go through uh, i see more but yeah right i mean to each to each our own interpretations this this to me f is yeah i think i recognize this from seiko's i'm pretty sure seiko marine masters have a similar aesthetic to this uh yeah i don't know they're trying to match the quarter elements too I don't even understand this. I'm going to actually get the images up and we can chat about the series. Let's get out of this and look at what's going on here. The reference Seawolf 53. Yep. 
um, I mean, we, we all know the significance of the sea wolf by now, right? One of the first dive watches like of its time, uh, 40 millimeters wide DLC coated Italian rubber straps. I like that quite a bit. And I then as, as Eric mentioned, what was it called? Cordone, uh, I'm not even going to try, but rounded. I'm going to get into the chat now in a moment. Bracelet version of the new Zodiac compression reference is that ceramic bezel insert. It's a it's a really superior looking watch. I love the colors, the hands. Now that I see it, I can't unsee it. It's like the Black Panther AP that we saw we saw the other day. Uh, yeah, looks good. Looks good. Oh no! Now we're spamming the ID guns Instagram handle. Yeah, that's that's something else to let everyone know. Um, my my arms have a have an Instagram. Don't ask. Uh, but that was that was something. I'm going to go on a hunger strike now. I think. I'm gonna to have to wear long sleeves. It's just, it's just too much. I don't know why. I don't know why this gained so much traction. But what the hell? Yeah, it's, it's entertainment. Entertainment for entertainment's sake. You can't deny it's pretty damn funny. So Mark II says it founded St. Petersburg, 1828, by Heinrich Moser. Oh, he's he's on the Mosers at the moment, so he's still, he's still lagging behind a little bit. Yeah, we we're on we we're on zodiacs. Um, shorter lugs to match those hands would look anything, but depending on the alcohol level. I think the one downside this watch has is that the, there's lots of talk about the lugs being quote unquote uninspired in a way. They're, they're super long and they don't really conform to the wrist as well. This was sort of true to the originals as well. I mean, the 35 mils, because they were so small, these are all 40 mils, so they do feel bigger. But the 35 mils, um, it worked for those pieces because I uh, know that it was all relative and the size worked out nicely. It's owned by Fossil. Yeah, thanks, Adidas, for that. Um, if you if those are called syringe hands, don't want to be injected. Yeah, I think the whole point that the, syr the syringe aspect syringe. What am I saying? Nice sketching on the table. I can't get out of this image. I love that. That's such a clean, clean look. And the, the whole idea of like the hollowed out seconds. It looks great. <sighs> Clearing up my throat again. I'm going to have to hold on a sec. This is the whole idea about the syringe element. Which is, yeah, it's it's a peculiar one, to say the least. Okay, let's, let's move off this guy. We've been chatting about it quite a while. Next up is a, this this thing, I can't get my head around. Um, we can chat about this for a while. We like our works here. We've chatted about them often. I think we discuss them. Uh-oh. What is this? Google has a temporary error. That was weird. Did I just break Google for a second? <laughs> I've never seen that before. Right, so this is the UR112 aggregate. And I was meaning to sit down and read through what makes this watch so specific. They have a new movement that they've incorporated in it. It's 250 grand. Just put that aside. Uh, it's so unlike the Uwerks that we know and that we see so often. And the comparisons we've chatted about, it could look like a desk clock, you know, with the, the flipping, what would you call it? The flip over desk clock with the numerals that run around. Uh, it looks like a bicycle light in a way. It looks like an alarm clock, a travel, a travel alarm, you know, a taser. Uh, it looks like a wind up. I mean, this wind up element looks like something you see on a camera. I just don't even know. You'd expect like LEDs in the front, you know. It's a strange, strange design. But I mean, this is something that you can definitely assign to what Uruk does with their pieces. This one, mm, I don't know. And the whole attachment system just looks like it was thrown on there. The beauty is that you open it up and you can appreciate the movement and all of that. I can't ever justify this, uh, Megan says. Yeah, I mean, that's that's it at the end of the day. I mean, look, it says push to... I swear that they got their inspiration by looking at bicycle lights. Guy was on his way to work one day and said, you know what? I'm just going to take a bicycle light casing and put a movement inside it. And hey, presto, we got it. We got it. Uh, reminds me of the, De of the Devon Tread. That's a J. Yeah. Devon Tread was a big deal. They still they still make their watches, hey? Uh, Tomoso loves them. Yeah, they're funky ones. They got that whole belt-driven system. Yeah, maybe that was a part of the inspiration too. Very good point there. Looks like Predator Watch device from 1987. I need to watch that film again. Is there, was there a similar one of those? I'm interested in that. Uh, very space tech. Yeah, that's a watch. Would alert airport security. It would. Actually, you know what else? This is an ankle bracelet. This could be something you'd be wearing if you're under house arrest. So the the memes just keep on coming with this piece. Like, you know, <laughs> this, is my, this is my ankle bracelet that I wear. You open this up and you can see the power reserve and that's guessing that's the date maybe. 
I don't know, probably, probably the date. Nuclear detector, yeah, right. I'm thinking ankle bracelet now, the more I see it. We just need some glowing LEDs on it to tell you that you're in the in the green or in the red. Looks like old school beeper on the watch band. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. Um, titanium, I mean, here we go again with the titanium bandwagon. Uh, all in all, though, yeah, just strange. Just a strange, strange model worth looking at because it's quite head scratching when we think of work as a brand and what they do normally with you know the 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 one the one ten and that typical arrangement of how the the hours work with the the numerals and the sides. Here's the internals. Why is there so much dust? <laughs> I my critique. This is a five K screen. We're looking at it through, so we we're picking up all <laughs> all the dust on the workbench. Sorry, is this monochrome? Sorry, monochrome for critiquing, but uh, yeah, time to bring it's it's winter winter dusting time in the in the office. Hmm, what a strange one. Yeah, I'll keep on new Bond watch. Right, right. Beam me up. I mean, where do we start? Has it quartz? What it really is quartz? Dirty air, yeah, right? That, I'm not going to say. That. Yep, that's it. Royal Tiger. Mm -hmm. Oh man, it's great. What a weird one. Next up, what else do we have? Uh, Okay, let's chat about this machine. Now, our man, our man Russell, I don't know if he's still with us in the chat, but he's been trying to register because he loves his Zeitwerks. He loves his lungers. He's been trying to register with one of these pieces, and it seems like they've all been assigned already. Yeah, now we're talking. Yeah, let's chat about this for a sec. Isn't it? I mean, look at that. So on the left, we have the render. On the right, we have the real image. This is so much nicer. This looks this looks rose gold on the uh oh hit the mic. This looks rose gold on the left, don't you think? So what makes this special? It's honey gold. Honey gold is like the latest just catchphrase that Lunga uses with their pieces. If they're special, if they're limited editions, the original Zeitwerk was introduced in platinum, the, the lumen. Sorry, the, the Zeitwerk lumen. We featured it about a hundred times on this on the live shows in the past. Ankle bracelet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we featured the Zeitwerk. I feel so privileged to say that we've been able to feature the Zeitwerk Lumen on live shows and see it operating and glowing in the dark. And Zeitwerk is the most technically complicated watch that, that Lange makes. It's amazing. This being a honey gold finish, it's just another one of those echelons you move up, even though platinum is even more rare and attractive. You know, Honey gold is pretty good, uh, all things considered. And I think that's about it. Like They haven't changed anything apart from just a different case material. Uh, oh, cool. They're going to be covering it. So he was the original Lumen Platinum. Our man Russell knows this one pretty well. And 2013, the Grand. Now they go through all of these. So there was the Lunga One Lumen, which is pretty cool. I haven't seen much talk about this watch, actually. It hasn't really gotten as much attention as the others. And then we jump down to, I think they're the Datagraph. No, this is another example of a Lunga One, another Lumen. And uh, up down, this is a very popular one. I set this as this, the day this watch came out. This became like a wallpaper. It was so, so good. New movement, twice power reserve. Okay, let's get to it and have a look at the, Hopefully, they share the case back. ALS are hard to get now. Prices will go up again. Yeah, I guarantee. Guarantee. So the Honey Gold Lumen, at first sight, you might imagine that this new Zeitwerk Lumen is basically the same. Yeah, like we all would. You'd be right to think so after a quick look. T-shaped bridge, and they talk about the watchmaking, which will take hours to discuss. That's it's such a such an interesting example. This this colorway works a lot better for this watch. If you're thinking, we chatted about minute repeaters and all of that. This gives you that classic looking grandfather clock style. Uh, the lumen element, the whole clear clear dial, is a bit of a modern take. What we would expect. Hey, they use is that a diamond? The base here for the bridge. Do they give you a case back shot? Surely they do. Surely they do. But one interesting thing that our man JCB brought to my attention is the the Gen 1 Zeitwerk. Let's see if I can pull that up quickly. This is something to definitely look at. Lunga Zeitwerk, uh, I'm just going to say Gen 1. Let's see if that works. Maybe not. Come on. Will we get it? See, not, it's just showing me the lumen, which sucks. The original model had this... This is such an excellent point that he gave me. Our man, Jean-Claude Beaver. Uh, blog to watch is going to pixelate it. Should I go into this quickly and discuss it? Might as well. We've only got a few more watches left, so we're kind of capping up the show at the moment. The original Zeitwerk had this awesome contrast of gray 
and and polished metal for this defining element across the dial. I don't know if this, of course, being the date complication is a bit different. Uh, will I find one that's good enough to look at? Probably not. Okay, I tried my best. Basically, if you squint your eyes and look, this whole shoulder wing arrangement really made this watch stand out and made it really you know, speak a different language. The one downside to these these artworks is that to give them that phantom, in quotations, phantom feel, uh, they have matched the bridge to the dial a little bit more. Look at the glow in the dark, though. It's so good. Okay, I'm missing you all in the chat. I am just, I'm just on this tirade discussing this piece. Push button for hour change. That's something new. I'm trying to... Is that something new? I didn't know that, Russell. That's the whole part of the new the new complication. Not a diamond. Oh, God. I'm getting all my specs wrong today. All my specs wrong. So they've added an entirely new movement to this watch. It's just amazing. Just such a work of art. Lungo just keeps on hitting it again and again and again. Beautiful complication. Fairly impressive. A fairly impressive improvement. Yeah, that's that's modesty right there. 1,800 vibrations per hour. That's, I didn't know that. Uh, 462 components. Uh, escape wheel clocks i don't uh no no i take the l out of that one 114 euros if you're interested uh they're only 200 pieces they've all by the sounds of it they've all been um allocated already by now I like the depth of the transparent dial yeah that's it's another thing i think given the choice if i had the option if if all the lungers were just thrown out to me i would i'd would probably go for the datagraph lumen over the zeitberg Something about the, the way the data graph works as like more of a tool watch in quotes. Yeah, 41 mils. I mean, we know that most of the specs of this watch, it's amazing. They're, they really are works of art. Such elegant pieces. 114, if you're interested, 200 pieces, honey gold, which makes it a lot more collectible because of its you know, significance as a metal. It's, it's uh, Lunga's proprietary in-house. 110 pounds. <laughs> 110K price is priced very high. Yeah. Time flies. Sure does. What else do we have? Another GP. Why did I choose this one again? I don't know why I chose this one. I think this was more of a critique element. This is the last. The last two watches are both green dials. Uh, Laureato again. I can't believe I chose. I bet you I sat. This was, I was probably doing this at like you know three in the morning putting these together. Because we have had three Laureatos on the show. Hmm. Now, that could also explain why it hasn't been such an exciting quarter for releases. All we have really been seeing are <laughs> different colors. Yeah, this is the Aston Martin piece. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a funky one. Now, at first glance, uh, let's see if I can get a close-up on the dial. Aston Martin's colorway, beautiful, beautiful emerald green. This is an actual like emerald green that we can enjoy. Kind of like a, what would we say? Porsche, Glatzia, Blau kind of tropical uh, sea foam green is that what we're going to call it but then it has this bizarre looking texture to the dial and that's supposed to mimic the stitching of the seats inside uh, the aston martin cars in general like the db9s and all of those i don't know i don't know so much i think this turned out to be a, more of a critique on the watch than, than anything after looking at that sapphire case that we did and and the titanium model this is a little bit excessive <laughs> Uh, it could see, yeah, I couldn't see the, the Riddler wearing this watch for sure, for sure. Just a huge question mark. Take the GP away, put a question mark at the top of the dial. It's the Riddler edition, you know. The color is beautiful, and I think that should not be forest green. Good point. Very good point. That's exactly it. I think that's that's exact. I'm I'm looking at it through a lens, obviously. Um, the whole the whole idea of this green being such a a vibrant emerald color instead of the typical um you know olive drab that we see so often this is a good change it's just the texture and funny enough the last watch that we're going to have a look at is also an emerald green probably one of the most beautiful ap watches that have been brought out to date yeah not a bad example that partnership is a bit weird i think gp did a better job with their three bridges the whole aston martin three bridge partnership that they did there was nice uh, anything else I'm missing in the chat? I don't know. I like the watch overall, but not the the, te uh, the the texture. Roar of the Tiger, you're not the only one. Yeah, it's weird. The, the dial, actually, the chronograph dial looks pretty generic. Isn't that weird to say? I do love, one thing I love about the, the whole case, we said this already, earlier about the um, the titanium, the way that the, the, the top of the, the bezel integrates so nicely around there. 
it's really clean i love it tied in so nicely yeah all in all not a bad looking piece nice presentation emerald is a seasonal color i mean i like that point it's just that texture to the dial which is a bit hit or miss seat stitching hmm. i mean and one one critique i had was instead of having this stitch having continual diamonds running across the dial think of it instead of your typical tapisserie where it's a square where it's where it's a square uh, have have more longer vertical lines like they're doing here but repeat that along the entire way don't crisscross the lines through the middle and stuff and make it look a bit jarring it just breaks it up a bit too much but i don't know that's just me that's just probably personal preference uh the watch is standard they only change the dial yeah i can understand that and last but not least another watch that they only changed the dial i thought this one would be well worth sharing just as the show comes to an end the last the last addition to the discussion and it's the the emerald royal oak emerald is just one of those pieces i find great if i can find an image of this uh, let's see time and tide yeah it's been an interesting discussion i must say please tell me that there's some live images no i don't want the renders monochrome hold on a second the last watch of the show i really like this piece uh come on monochrome always there to take it home for us the strap and the dial pattern yeah it's a bit conflicting to say the least so this is a this is a jumbo i think it falls under the 15202 line but they've gone with the fume dial effect on this piece and this is how you do <laughs> this is how you do a green dial on a watch uh i like the simplicity to this piece and appreciate that it's it's not going the typical tapisserie route. It's actually thinking of a more flat presence. It keeps it simple and basic. And I think it's to this watch's favor. I don't know when this watch came out. I think it was around September. I'll have to double check. But such a beautiful example. It epitomizes the Royal Oak a lot. And just think about the different colors we could go with, with an example like this. You could go with like a burgundy, purple, blues, light blues, dark blues, anything really and you would get the same kind of result it's that it's that fume effect that they've managed to nail with this piece that i think makes it sing and russell i've been trying my <laughs> looks like a moser dial i've been trying my best to get russell on board with looking at aps he still hasn't um he still hasn't jumped ship yet but i i feel like we're going to influence him to look at one of these once you get one of these on your wrist i think you'll be sold russell just saying just saying so this was a gphg winner i did not know that Diamond pattern is meant to be the reminiscent of the, yeah, the diamond pattern stitching on the leather. Yeah, that's it, Mason. I chatted about it earlier. Not to be the dead horse, but I think Enigma would, <laughs> would look even better with an AP. Yeah, I would say as well. Um, yeah, that's that's the Riddler. One thing I want to know, I, I've always actually wanted to question this, is this loomed in the middle here? Because that's such a cool feature if it is. They've actually thrown some loom in between the AP on the dial just to break it up. And when it glows in the dark, there's something that stands out i just whoa that is funky this is probably like a, a late 80s 90s transitional piece i don't know what that's about maybe oh hold on a sec maybe this was also a special edition with this kind of texture that they've okay okay i think i'm getting there great looking piece just subtle simple a nice way to end off the show we've tried to keep it design related throughout the presentation and i think this also just caps off on an excellent piece of design um this is an ape is amazing watch so is the minute repeater yeah the minute repeater is just on another level i didn't feature that that was also released over the course of the month right platinum yeah uh it does look like a loom reference yeah right i don't know uh maybe i should read the article <laughs> make a difference yeah this is probably I, honestly seeing the just the the repetition of the tapestry dials everywhere today and the blue everywhere the blue dial sports watch this takes the royal oak into a different category altogether i think it feels a lot more appropriate for a watch like this don't you think classic 70s fact now timeless design yeah i mean this is super modern but also super old school it gives you that uh what's a 2001 space odyssey effect yeah it sounds like everyone i think everyone is now yeah conjuring three adidas i hope it's not too late in the evening watching that uh yeah we've had a we've had a good chat everyone this has been fun We've gone through, I mean, look at all these tabs open at the top. We've gone through quite a selection. As far as choosing one of the best of the series, it's pretty difficult. Maybe Q4, we can do like a highlight reel of some of the best, best watches of the year, releases-wise. I don't know what we're going to see for <laughs> Q4 as a close, though, realistically. 
I mean, what are they going to be bringing out around December time? I, I really don't know. Uh, but this was fun. I like I like the fact that it's a lot more mellow and it's a bit more interactive, and we're sharing what have been you know, what's been released here and there, left, right, center. Russell, thank you, and ladies and gents, it's always a pleasure doing these shows. I hope that the little avatar on the left hand side wasn't too distracting. That might have gotten in the way as I was talking. But this uh, this emerald is just a cut above the rest. One of the most beautiful. The fact that it's platinum, I didn't even mention that. I should actually have a look at the specs a bit more if I can get out of this. Should we look at the price? I think most of these are probably sold by now, but I mean, it's so much to enjoy. And of course, these have been discontinued, right? So the 15202, this is the last of, of this range. Now they've all jumped to the 41 mils and those examples. Uh, 90, 90 Swiss, fla Swiss, Swiss flanks, excluding taxes. What can we say? 100 pieces produced in 2021. Yeah, love the green royal oak. One of my very few favorite greens. Very disappointed that Patek is olive and not emerald. It's it's bothersome, actually. I know some of us probably feel the same, that emerald is where it's at. That's like the luxury element. But if you are dealing with a steel watch, at the same time, I think uh, olive does have some some edge to it because it does give you a bit more of a, an outdoor active feel. Yeah, but as always, ladies and gents, thank you for joining. And Russell, again, thanks for the super chat. I'm going to stop. The screen sharing, I don't know how long we've been going for. Uh, stop screen, that worked, right? Show's been running now for, was that, three and a half hours? Yeah, it's insane. Uh, still have still have a tip. The Bolivar Mill ship is a 60 mil lug. Forstner NASA JB mesh adjust from 16. I love those. Those Forstner bands are great. Yeah, I know exactly the model you're talking about, um, the JB Champion model. And it's great to see those adjustable lug lengths that you can get. No, sorry, the adjustable uh, bracelet lengths that you can get given. Time does fly. It does fly. Edwin, thank you for hopping in. And so many more of you who've been in the chat who maybe haven't haven't been tuning in or, or chatting. Uh, it's, it's great to have you. Like I love these shows just for the interaction and being able to share just a bizarre range of pieces. It's nice to look through micro brands, but also the big names and some of the outliers that definitely deserve a bit more love. Uh, but until next time, we're going to be doing wrist shot week, I think, in two weeks' time again. So send your emails to me. It's in the description of this video. We like to catch up. And yeah, wrist shot week's always a blast. I can't believe the year is almost finished. That's insane. November already. <laughs> 2021 has disappeared. Yeah, Thomas, thank you. Uh, shout out to Blue Shirt once again. Uh, the, throughout this show in the chat, I'll be sure to link this at the end of the show in the comments if you would like to go and support our man on the GoFundMe some more. Um, yeah. Anyway, ladies and gents, thank you as always. I'm going to hit the hay hard, I think, tonight. It's been one of those days. Uh, but take care of yourselves. Enjoy your Sunday. And I will catch you in the next one. Cheers for now.